Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Joanne Valit. I'm the director of the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, International Trade Administration's office here in San Jose downtown, just a few blocks from here. Um, so welcome to our second and final day of the Select Bay Area um, Investment Immersion Program. I hope you really enjoyed uh, the day in San Francisco yesterday. Um, I heard everything went really smoothly and great series of speakers, so that was great to hear. Um, my colleague uh, Doug Wallace and I um, uh, from, uh, from our San Francisco office have really been honored to have you all join us. We know you're, you're incredibly busy. You've traveled from long distances. Um, and uh, it really is a, a real treat for us to be able to host you here in the Bay Area for a couple days and kind of give you a view of the landscape. So we have a fantastic program prepared for you today here in San Jose. We have uh, a number of, of fantastic speakers. Um, which will build on um, yesterday's program, focus on, on San Francisco, and then today we kind of turn our t attention towards the South Bay. Um, San Jose is by far the largest uh, city in this metro area, in the South Bay, uh, and is really truly an economic powerhouse uh, when it comes to promoting trade, investment, technology, and the economy. And this morning we are honored to have Vice Mayor Chappie Jones jo join us this morning. Uh, to welcome you all here to Silicon Valley. The vice mayor was elected in 2014. Prior to his career in public service, he worked in the tech sector with Apple and AT&T, and he owned his own tech services company. The vice mayor has his undergrad from the University of California, Davis, and an MBA from uh, the Berkeley Haas School of Business. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Has everybody had their coffee? Yeah. <laughs> okay. let's, let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. All right, much better, much better. So understand that uh, yesterday you spent time in San Francisco, so it's good that uh, we saved the best for last, <laughs> which is San Jose. You got, you got San Francisco out of the way, and now you're going to get to the good stuff. So on behalf of the mayor and the city council, I want to welcome you uh, here today at, to City Hall. Uh, we're pleased to have representatives from many international locations, governments, and uh, officials visiting San Jose. We really value the relationship with the U.S. Department of Commerce Commercial Service San Jose office, which organized today's select Bay Area Investor Immersion Program. San Jose is a, a dynamic place. Uh, all over the world, people have been trying to replicate what's going on in San Jose. You can, you can imitate us, but you can't really duplicate us. And the reason why is there's a secret sauce that's going on here in San Jose, and that's the people, the, the, the people who populate our community. It's a very diverse community of, of residents from all over the world. So if you spend time here, you can have conversations and meet people from many different backgrounds, cultures, and, and viewpoints and perspectives on, on, on the world and on business. We're not afraid to take risks here in San Jose. So it's, there's a culture here of entrepreneurship, of innovation, of risk taking, that is hard to duplicate. We have such talented people here. If you come here, if you locate your business here, if you inv invest here, if you do any activities that involve the people who live in San Jose and Silicon Valley, you're going to find that there's a dynamic energy that's happening here that's not able to be replicated anywhere else in the world. So we really value and welcome uh, the fact that you're here today to learn more about what's going on, try to understand what that secret sauce that makes San Jose special and Silicon Valley special. And if you want to understand the economic impact of what's going on in San Jose, in 2018, San Jose exported and Silicon Valley exported upwards of $22 billion of goods and services. If you look at Silicon Valley as a, its own economy, it's in, it's in the teens, like 15th or 16th largest economy in the world. So imagine what's going on here. Imagine what you can take advantage of if you do business here. So again, 
I want to welcome you here to Silicon Valley. I want to welcome you here to San Jose. And I want to welcome you here to City Hall. Get a lot of, out of today. It's going to be very informative. You're going to get a lot of good information. And hopefully, we can do business with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, and thank you so much to the City of San Jose, who's always, for decades, been a really strong partner of the Department of Commerce. So next, we dive a little bit deeper into uh, some of the uh, programming and uh, services, a little bit more about uh, the economy of, of San Jose and how you can tap into uh, both manufacturing, the foreign trade zone, um, and we are here represented today by two folks from the city of San Jose. Um, we have Chris Burton, who is the deputy director of the Business and Economic Development Office for the city. Um, apart from working on projects related to the North San Jose plan, the urban village concept, and housing, three small, small topics, right, Chris? Um, Chris also leads the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Roundtable, which is a collaborative effort um, of, of uh, cities, communities, um, not just in San Jose, but in the, in the surrounding area, to support manufacturing uh, here in Silicon Valley. Chris is joined by Joe Hedges, who manages the international programs for the city of San Jose, and has really been a, a key component, a partner, actually, of, of, of bringing today's uh, program uh, in, into reality. So thank, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Joe has worked for the City of San Jose since 1991, manages all of the international facing work uh, conducted by, by the city. Uh, he also manages the Foreign Trade Zone, which is uh, uh, under the Foreign Trade Zone Board of the Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration, and he'll be sharing some more information on the Foreign Trade Zone here in San Jose um, and how you can tap into that as a, as a business here in the Valley. So thank you, Chris and Joe. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Joanne. We really appreciate our partnership with uh, the Department of Commerce, and we really appreciate uh, you uh, bringing such a great group uh, to come meet with us today, uh, to come enjoy City Hall, uh, and come and experience San Jose firsthand. We're pretty proud of our city, uh, and we're pretty proud of the opportunity to share it with you. So Joe and I are going to run through a whole host of slides. We'll cover a multitude of topics, but we'll probably go quick. Um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. So we're probably just going to skim over the top, um, but you'll, you'll see a ton more today. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it here. We have a fabulous city. Um, where am I pointing? Am I pointing on the right one? Ah, take that one. OK, so you've heard the high level a couple of times, but just to touch on all the key points, um, we're actually an old city by California standards. The uh, city of San Jose was founded 73 years before the state of California, uh, back in 1777. We're actually a big city from a geography standpoint, and we're also a big city from a population standpoint. So we're the third largest in California, the 10th largest in the US, um, and significantly bigger than our neighbors to the north who you met with yesterday. Um, but I'm going to stop that, because everybody else has had a go at them already. <laughs> Um, a <laughs> little over a million residents, uh, 48, so uh, roughly sort of 440,000 sort of jobs in San Jose specific. Uh, when we talk about San Jose, we talk about the city. We also talk about the metro area, which is really what you think of when people talk about traditional Silicon Valley. It's a host of smaller cities that surround one big city in the core, which is, uh, which is San Jose. Um, and then approximately 53,000 businesses, again, just in San Jose alone. Um, just because we're in City Hall, I wanted to touch on, give you a quick uh, brief overview on who we are and kind of what we're doing. Um, so actually, we're a relatively small organization by big city standards. We're only about 6,400 employees. Um, we have a mayor and a vice mayor, um, 10 council members that are elected by district that cover sort of different areas of the city and oversee over 21 different departments that include things from water, pla uh, water control plants to police to fire to uh, an airport, wh which we're pretty proud of as well. Uh, our annual operating budget and capital budget is a little under $5 billion a year. 
Um, and then within that 6,400 uh, person organization, there's 12 of us that are responsible for those 53,000 businesses. Um, so our business and economic development team is pretty busy, and we have to be pretty targeted and pretty focused with our efforts. So we'll generally work with anywhere between sort of 300 and 500 businesses a year, specifically within San Jose, and we're focusing on you know, employers, key industries, those folks that um, uh, have a strategic play in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, or people that have significant revenue generation opportunities for the city, because we have to pay that four and a half billion dollar bill every year. Um, that includes a, a host of different sized companies. We're obviously working with the Googles and Apples of the world, but it goes right the way down to sort of individuals and small entrepreneur sort of enterprises um, that are looking to find their way in the valley. Um, and we connect them through a whole series of different programs and strategic partnerships that we've established uh, over a, a long period of time. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from Joe. Um, so kind of why San Jose? We wanted to touch a little bit on what our value proposition is uh, and kind of dive into why this is such an interesting and, and cool place. Um, we're definitely uh, continuing to iterate. You hear the word iterate a lot in tech, um, and we feel that way about our city. We're continuing to develop this place. Um, we were there at the founding of Silicon Valley um, as it grew out of uh, Stanford and Palo Alto. Um, but we're also at the forefront of creating a new urban sort of tech campus uh, in the valley to produce new spaces that will attract new talent and develop new ideas. Um, so we believe very much in the mindset that we have here and that we continue to develop. Um, but there's really four key pieces to that secret source. There's some other bits as well that I might touch on, but not too much because it's a secret. Um, but ultimately, what it comes down to, Weissmer also already talked about talent. Um, talent is our greatest asset. Um, we have access here. Um, we have the space, um, you know, as you look around, you're not surrounded by 30-story skyscrapers. There's kind of room to move around and have different types of experiences. Um, and then it's also just an excellent place to be. Um, we have sort of amenities and lifestyle aspects that make this a truly uh, uh, fabulous place to, to have a, a business or to have a family or to live your life. Um, so to touch on talent, what are we really talking about? So uh, at the core of our talent is three major universities um, that range from Stanford, Santa Clara University, and then if you were to walk out this door at the end of this hallway, you'd walk straight into San Jose State. It's right on our doorstep. Um, people don't talk about San Jose State as much as they should. Um, uh, it, it's literally the engine of Silicon Valley. It produces more engineers than uh, all of the other colleges in the area combined, and about 70% of those engineers stay in the valley uh, in jobs in tech companies. Uh, so combined, those three institutions are pumping out more than 6,500 uh, uh, engineering students and graduates um, with computer science, engineering, and business degrees every year. Um, so that's a huge asset. That's why we have the talent, um, is that we have this sort of ground up approach and we retain that talent locally. As well, we're a very diverse city. So about 40% of our population is foreign born. So we're attracting talent from all over the world as well. Uh, so access and, you know, access for any of you that came down in the bus today uh, from San Francisco, congratulations, you made it. Um, <laughs> few. <laughs> um, so access is a challenge in the Bay Area. There's this huge body of water that's in the middle that kind of makes it difficult to move around. Um, but we're really blessed in that we have good uh, local transportation and that we're continuing to build that out. So we have direct Caltrain service to San Francisco and the peninsula. We have Ace Train uh, and the Capital Corridor going out to the east. And we have our own light rail station and bus, uh, light rail system and bus rapid transit. And then we're adding now um, BART, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transit that goes from San Francisco into the East Bay. It's now coming down. It will be open this year in East San Jose. And we now have funding to bring that all the way down to downtown San Jose. And we'll connect to the airport in Santa Clara eventually as well. Um, and then we're really proud of that airport as well. We've spent uh, a lot of time and a lot of investment uh, really making our airport experience uh, uh, truly much better than anything else you'll get in the region. Did anybody fly into San Jose? Congratulations, you win. Uh, did anybody fly into San Francisco? No? A couple? Yeah, that's a headache, right? <laughs> so think about that when booking future travel. Um, it is America's fastest growing airport. Uh, we're adding flights across the nation and international service as well. Um, and it is literally, you could be there in 15 minutes from downtown San Jose. It's a huge amenity. Um, so just to touch on sort of the different experiences and places that you'll experience in San Jose, um, you know, downtown is under a massive transformation right now. Uh, you'll see the sort of cranes across the street. Um, there's a lot of change in the office space going on. Um, if you sort of don't follow the local news, which I imagine not all of you will, 
Uh, we're currently working with Google on a new plan to open a uh, new six million square foot campus just east of the river next to Duradon Station that will add another 25,000 employees to downtown. That's driven a whole new wave of real estate investment in downtown San Jose and we're seeing a new resurgence that's, uh, that's really quite incredible and driving a lot of interest. Um, but that's not our only, our only asset. Uh, for the sort of traditional uh, Silicon Valley experience, uh, our major innovation district is in North San Jose. It's an area that's around sort of 5,000 acres. It's a significantly large traditional office and industrial park um, that we've sort of evolved over time. So now we're adding retail and amenities. We have new bike trails, new schools. Uh, and there's a plan for the city to add 32,000 new residential units in North San Jose so people can live close to where they work uh, and have access to all that employment. And then lastly, for the sort of more traditional sort of uh, pastoral uh, campus industrial setting, if you go south, uh, 20 minutes to South San Jose, um, uh, we have an area called Edenvale, which is a very well-established business park. Uh, companies like Western Digital, uh, Striker Endoscopy um, have their manufacturing facilities. You'll see South San Jose today on your trip to see Jabel. Um, they're located down there as well. Um, so we have the sort of very diverse experiences uh, for different companies in different areas of the city. Um, we also have... Uh, you know, this is the sort of down in the numbers basics, but you know, uh, the other thing that we have that San Francisco and uh, Mountain View and some of those other high cost locations have is a lot more available and accessible uh, space. So, you know, we have all these great things and we're cheaper too. So we think we're a really good attraction and investment opportunity. Um, you get a lot more for your money in San Jose, plus you're located to the, the majority of that talent pool uh, that we already touched on. And then lastly, uh, on the sort of amenities side, um, so in addition to having world-class retail through Westfield, um, you know, incredible entertainment opportunities, uh, two major sports teams on the uh, doorstep with the San Jose Sharks and San Francisco 49ers liked it so much in the South Bay, even they moved down here. Um, we also have, you know, an amazing sort of open, uh, open space environment and access to the outdoors. And so, you know, we love to highlight some of these pieces. So just things like the bikeways that you have. So bikeways throughout San Jose are almost like their own sort of separate transportation network, um, a whole host of different unique trail systems. Uh, people literally commute to work using our trail systems. They run north-south uh, from downtown all the way out to the bay and connect to the bay trail, which you can go sort of all the way. I could technically ride, I, I live north of here about 30 miles. I could technically ride my bike to work. I wouldn't have been here right now. I certainly wouldn't be standing right now, but, um, but I could have. <laughs> so it's a great opportunity. It's a great sort of lifestyle plug, uh, uh, an opportunity for folks here. So uh, onto the sort of really important stuff, just to quickly kind of take a look at what we talk about when we talk about tech and industries. Obviously, the, the metro is just dominated by the tech sector, um, a, a huge proportion of jobs uh, in a whole host of different technology. We're here at really the sort of birthplace of, of many of the new technologies that are dominating the space uh, throughout uh, the world right now. Um, San Jose's experience has been slightly different to the rest of the valley. So uh, where we see our strength uh, back, if you go into sort of the original sort of stages of Silicon Valley when it was focused largely on semiconductor. San Jose was where you came to build stuff. Um, we had strength and depth in manufacturing um, from sort of our semiconductor days right the way through to uh, computer production as we evolved sort of on into clean tech and solar. And now we're sort of developing new technologies around flexible hybrid electronics, uh, around uh, 5G networking, uh, and around uh, AI. So, um, <coughs> so the manufacturing sector within technology has been hugely significant um, for us in San Jose. When you look at it from a, a GDP standpoint, and the vice mayor touched on this as well, just a huge amount of economic activity is related to hardware and manufacturing uh, through this region. Um, and generally what we're talking about when we talk about manufacturing um, is, is what other people might think of as R&D. Um, we're not your typical large-scale production manufacturing center. What we have is a host of service providers that have been located here because this is where industries were developed, but they're also servicing all their top clients in the area. So, you know, Cisco, in certain classifications, would be considered a manufacturing company. They don't build their own products. Their products are built by a host of uh, contract manufacturers um, like Jabel, uh, like Fl uh, Foxconn, like Flextronics. Um, Celestica, Benchmark, all of those major manufacturers, global manufacturers, 
have at least 100,000 square feet either in the city of San Jose or on our borders. Um, below that, there's a whole host of tier two and tier three manufacturers um, that range from two guys in a room with a CNC machine, right the way through to fairly sophisticated um, and automated operations. Uh, we have a, a growing manufacturer in North San Jose called Vanderbend. Uh, they produce the um, uh, metal work and the casing for a lot of surgical equipment. Um, you know, to, to bend metal and, and sort of create metal boxes, essentially, and some of the equipment that goes in them. Doesn't seem like it has a cost advantage to be in one of the highest cost locations in the country. Um, but because of the skills expertise around the talent and because of the access to the market and their customers, it's critical that they have their major facility here in San Jose. <coughs> So, um, so this kind of gives you a sense of the sort of jobs distribution, and you'll see sort of, I, I appreciate that this table's a bit of an eye test, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, but that computer and electronics product manufacturing is hugely significant for us. So the city has been focused uh, for the last uh, eight to 10 years on how we continue to support and grow our manufacturing community. Um, because it represents a huge employment opportunity, because it represents the core of our sort of experience with Silicon Valley, um, but then also because it offers a range of opportunities to the residents that live here. Uh, some of the city's work specifically around manufacturing has been around preserving the space. So as this is a high cost location, people wanna build high office. Um, and we know that we need to preserve uh, a diversity of space that includes flex, uh, that includes manufacturing or R&D space. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around workforce development to ensure that local community colleges and universities are producing the types of talent that can continue to support manufacturing locally. And then we're building partnerships and making strategic investments around the industry. So back in 2014, the federal government had a program to develop um, new manufacturing innovation institutes across the country. So MMI number seven is in North San Jose. It's focused on flexible hybrid electronics and over $75 million of federal funding uh, through defense and other departments and energy um, have come through that facility as sort of R&D projects. So we're seeing sort of a resurgence in that area as well. Um, so I'm going to skip forward because I want to make sure I leave time for Joe, but just to kind of touch on where those occupations are and why this is important to us from an economic development standpoint is you'll see the sort of the range of income that, that manufacturing uh, provides for the sort of diverse set of the population that exists here. So, um, you know, from the high end at $70 an hour right the way through to, um, you know, sort of uh, towards our kind of minimum wage uh, type levels. But um, what manufacturing offers to residents of our community is that pathway that goes from the bottom end right the way through to the top. So it's a, a critical part of our local economy. And then lastly, before I just flick over to Joe, just to kind of leave, you know, with, with those high points. So fastest GDP growth uh, of all major US metros. This is where, you know, the activity is occurring. Um, a massive labor force focused on technology and information um, that continues to drive that economy, um, as well as the sort of business services and management that supports it. And so I will skip over and, and leave it to Joe to finish off on FTZ, and then we'll be available for questions. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, and uh, again, welcome to San Jose. I'm very pleased to join uh, uh, with you this morning to talk about an important uh, trade program that we have in San Jose, uh, the Foreign Trade Zone. And the Foreign Trade Zone is one of the nation's earliest trade programs that was established by the US Congress uh, 85 years ago. And um, this is a program that um, Foreign-owned companies are able to take advantage of. In fact, many of the operators of foreign trade zones in the United States are foreign-owned companies. Um, many countries have free trade zones. Uh, in the United States, the foreign trade zone program is very unique. And so I'd like to share some information about this program with you and uh, encourage your businesses to consider operating in the United States as a foreign trade zone. Um, a foreign trade zone is territory in the United States that is outside of the jurisdiction of U.S. Customs. So um, merchandise that enters uh, the United States that is directed into a foreign trade zone technically does not enter U.S. Customs territory. It's in international commerce. And a foreign trade zone uh, can include uh, merchandise that is stored, uh, manufactured, or 
assembled, and it's considered to be in international commerce. Um, as I indicated, um, the US Congress established the Foreign Trade Zone back in 1934, which was shortly after uh, the Depression in the United States, and it was a way to encourage international trade and commerce in the United States, um, and also to stimulate uh, leadership in global trade and commerce. Uh, San Jose's Foreign Trade Zone was established in 1974, and so we were the 18th Foreign Trade Zone established nationwide. Um, in the Bay Area, there are uh, foreign trade zones uh, managed by the Port of San Francisco and also by the City of Oakland, and a total of 17 foreign trade zones uh, in the state of California. Um, this is a unique program in that it represents um, a federal government program um, in partnership at the local level. Um, the Foreign Trade Zones Board is comprised of the U.S. Department of Commerce and also the U.S. Treasury Department, and this is the federal government agency that oversees the program. Um, U.S. Customs and Border Protection are responsible for the management of operations uh, of foreign trade zones, and when a company applies to, uh, for the foreign trade zone designation, um, the foreign trade zone is reviewed and approved by the Foreign Trade Zones Board, but the actual foreign trade zone site is activated by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So those are the key critical partners uh, in the foreign trade zone program. Uh, in addition, there are many federal government agencies that have some oversight responsibility of foreign trade zones. So uh, it is a, a very uh, unique program. Um, The benefits are, of a foreign trade, zone, foreign trade zone are that no duties are paid on merchandise that is admitted into a foreign trade zone. Um, duties are paid only when the goods enter U.S. Customs territory. Uh, so duties are exempt on merchandise um, that enter the foreign trade zone, and then those goods are exported from the foreign trade zone. So a foreign trade zone allows a company to delay, reduce, or eliminate duties on goods that enter the foreign trade zone. Uh, there are many benefits of a foreign trade zone. Uh, first, it allows uh, a foreign trade zone company to preserve cash flow. Uh, so no duties are paid when the item enters the foreign trade zone. Uh, it's a way to better control your inventory. Uh, you're able to eliminate duties on scrap or damaged uh, merchandise. Um, it improves the uh, operations of a company. A company is able to enter weekly duty entries rather than daily entries. Um, and it enhances your global competitiveness. It allows companies in, that are operating in the United States to better compete in the global marketplace. Um, there are many activities that are permitted in a foreign trade zone. Storage, uh, testing of materials, repackaging, manipulation, um, exhibiting, repairing merchandise, uh, and uh, critically important is manufacturing or production. So many of the large companies that utilize the foreign trade zone are actually manufacturing. So the city of San Jose is the grantee, and uh, ways that a company can utilize a foreign trade zone is to apply to become an operator. And uh, as the grantee, the city of San Jose is technically the applicant on behalf of the company to the federal government. And I'll describe what that application process is in just a moment. But another option for a company is to utilize a, an existing foreign trade zone facility. And you're able to utilize that facility uh, to do anything you would like with the exception of manufacturing. So if you want to manufacture or produce a product, you need to to apply to have that uh, specific authority um, by your own company rather than by utilizing an existing facility. Um, the city of San Jose is the grantee, so the city of San Jose applies to the U.S. Foreign Trade Zones Board on behalf of a company. Um, uh, roughly 10 years ago, the federal government streamlined the application process and as a result of that, the city went through the process to redesignate our foreign trade zone as well. And uh, there were critical benefits to that. One was that the application 
uh, review changed from anywhere from eight to 12 months to as little as 30 days. And the application itself changed from uh, what looked like a three ring binder to 10 questions. Uh, and so it, it made it very streamlined and it made it easier for small and mid-sized companies to access the foreign trade zone and to become operators in their own um, manner. Um, the, um, for companies that are seeking production authority or manufacturing use, uh, there's a 120-day review. And then following that, the, co the company completes the application. So the process is a little bit longer for companies that are seeking uh, production authority, but still it's uh, a greatly streamlined process. Um, the foreign trade zone um, uh, has had tremendous uh, economic benefit throughout the United States. Uh, as you can see, in 1980, uh, it was a $1 billion worth of merchandise in foreign trade zones. Last year, that grew to nearly $800 billion. Um, in San Jose, we have uh, several companies that are operating their businesses as foreign trade zone. And when I say San Jose, I'm talking about the service area that is incorporated under the San Jose foreign trade zone. So our foreign trade zone companies include a company that designs and um, manufactures satellites, which are commercial satellites, which are launched into space. Um, they operate as a foreign trade zone. We have a company that uh, designs uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Um, they operate as a foreign trade zone. We have an electric uh, vehicle company, which I'm sure you can identify. Uh, they have operated as a foreign trade zone since, since the company was established. Um, and then we also have an energy company uh, operating as a foreign trade zone. And just recently we received approval for a company that is in networking equipment um, receive approval for their foreign trade zone. And then we also have a company that operates a foreign trade zone as a warehouse logistics center. And, and so those are the companies that operate as foreign trade zones in the San Jose region. Two thirds of the merchandise in a foreign trade zone, however, is domestic. So the US program allows both US products and uh, foreign um, products that enter a foreign trade zone to co-mingle within a foreign trade zone. Um, the foreign trade zone also is uh, an important facilitator of U.S. exports. Um, so as you can see, um, in 2010, $35 billion in exports. Last year, $112 billion of exports in the U.S. Uh, came from foreign trade zones throughout the United States. Um, a foreign trade zone uh, grantee is technically, is usually a city, a county, an airport, a port authority, or even a state. So it's a public agency that operates the foreign trade zone as a public benefit. Um, the grantee is responsible for the oversight of zone operations. And in San Jose, we view the uh, foreign trade zone as an important economic development tool. Um, the, uh, the cost uh, has been greatly reduced, uh, the fees, uh, uh, been more or less waived in San Jose, so we view this as a way to stimulate the economy, uh, to keep and maintain jobs, and also su to support our manufacturing base. Um, the San Jose Foreign Trade Zone includes not only uh, the city of San Jose, but also all of the cities of Santa Clara County, and also uh, closer to the coast, um, Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley, which are in Santa Cruz County, and then the southern part of Alameda County, as part of the foreign trade zone for San Jose. And so companies that are within our service area are able to receive expedited uh, access to the foreign trade zone based on our designation with the US uh, federal government. So in closing, uh, the foreign trade zone was established by the US Congress. It's been around for 85 years and uh, we think it's going to be around for a lot longer than that. Uh, it is an important program in supporting jobs and uh, economic development in the United States. Uh, it uh, enhances global competitiveness uh, for companies that are operating in the United States. Uh, many of the 
330 plus companies that operate their business as a foreign trade zone are companies from outside of the United States that have made key investments in the United States. So they operate their business in the United States as a foreign trade zone. And they're able to access all the benefits as a US owned company would. Um, and uh, nationwide there are over 3,300 companies that are utilizing a foreign trade zone in the 50 US states plus Puerto Rico. And then uh, finally, again, the foreign trade zone is territory in the United States that is considered to be outside of the jurisdiction of U.S. Customs. But that territory um, is, a, uh, you know, is subject to all U.S. laws. So uh, any product that can legally enter the United States uh, is able to enter a foreign trade zone. And um, so with that, I would like to pause and turn the mic over to Joanne. But thank you very much, and the city of San Jose would be very pleased to work with any company uh, regarding the foreign trade zone and also with foreign governments uh, that uh, are seeking to bring investment into the United States. Their companies are able to access a foreign trade zone in San Jose or elsewhere in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Joe and Chris. We. Um, we have time for maybe maybe one question. I know, Joe, you're going to be with us all day, right? And uh, including into this evening, I believe that you're going to be on the bus as well. Okay, so Joe will be available all day today. Um, but maybe we have time for a question, one question. Yes. No. Um, any company can apply to utilize, well, any company or even individual in the United States can access a foreign trade zone that is currently uh, in operation. So that's generally the company or individual working with a, a foreign trade zone operator and paying uh, fees that are based on the service that are provided by that company. Uh, all foreign trade zone um, warehouse type facilities are required to have uh, posted fees to the federal government and uh, to be within reason. Uh, for a company that's seeking to operate as um, a foreign trade zone, um, there are no minimum requirements, although it's important for a company to really uh, investigate what the savings will, will be um, because uh, a foreign trade zone is a significant commitment in terms of of the fact that you're operating a facility that is outside of the jurisdiction of U.S. Customs. So you have special responsibilities uh, with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, you know, they're very fo much focused on making sure the site is secure and that um, the, the, um, the uh, you know, merchandise that enters a foreign trade zone is safe and secure and it's important for companies to be able to track the movement of the goods that enter the foreign trade zone and also depart from the foreign trade zone so that but there are no minimum requirements for a company to apply to either utilize a foreign trade zone or to operate as uh, a foreign trade zone anyone else have a Quick question. Yes, deep. Joe, could you tell us how uh, the foreign trade program, um, FTZ program, uh, uh, worked during the trade war we had over the last two years? Have you seen a, a renewed interest? Um, was it kind of a, a sanctuary for foreign companies that uh, uh, you know sought to import and export? Could you explain, please? Um, well, certainly the foreign trade zone um, became more well known in, in the recent years because of the uh, trade friction and, and the, um, uh, the fact that various uh, tariffs or duties were imposed and so forth. Um, the foreign trade zone is, is, you know, companies need to look at this as a long-term uh, commitment rather than something that's going to provide uh, immediate or, or temporary relief. Um, for items or merchandise that is subject to tariffs, um, they're able to be admitted into a foreign trade zone without uh, those tariffs or duties being paid. But uh, 
if that merchandise does enter U.S. Customs territory, any tariffs or duties that are, that are in place at the time must be paid. Um, so it's not a way to avoid uh, tariffs or duties that might be imposed. Um, however, for um, uh, merchandise that is being exported from a foreign trade zone, technically that merchandise has not entered U.S. Customs territory, so any tariffs or duties that might be in place um, are not uh, collected by the federal government. And so, um, whereas if you're not utilizing a foreign trade zone, uh, you would be paying those duties. So it would uh, certainly provide some type of relief uh, for some companies depending on their, their own situation. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Chris. Thank you both very much. Well, no discussion of um, the business climate and opportunities in Silicon Valley in terms of opening an office here would be uh, complete uh, without a discussion of the, the real estate sector. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, at the top, I would say, maybe of the top two or three things that companies are looking at when um, they're, they're thinking about, uh, you know, uh, establishing themselves in the United States. Um, but, of course, where, where do we start? You learned a little bit about this um, yesterday when you were in San Francisco, um, and today we're, we're really thrilled um, to have an expert speaker here from CBRE to, uh, to help us uh, understand the landscape in Silicon Valley. So yesterday we visited uh, an incubator uh, in Sunnyvale, Today, we're going to be visiting a co-working space um, here in downtown. Uh, we're also going to be seeing a manufacturing facility. We, we, we look around uh, this morning. We see cranes in operation. So we know that there's probably a lot going on uh, in the real estate sector. So this morning, we have uh, Matt Taylor joining us. He is Senior Vice President of CBRE. CBRE Group is the world's largest commercial real estate firm and is included in the Fortune 500 since 2008. Matt specializes in high-tech office and R&D clients. Matt, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> I'm uh, happy to be able to do this and, and speak with you. And uh, as a speaker, I'm very conversational, so if you have a question or comment while we're going through it, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll, I'll get to you then. I left plenty of time at the end for questions as well too, but um, happy to be able to have this opportunity to speak to everybody. The Silicon Valley real estate market is extremely dynamic, as Joanne mentioned, and there are a lot of things that are changing right now, a lot of things happening, uh, especially here in San Jose. Uh, it's very exciting to be able to work here. Uh, my office is actually right down the street, uh, and there's a lot of things that are happening here, but the Valley as a whole has gone through, uh, let's see if I could get this to work, there we go. Um, the Valley as a whole has gone through a lot of changes uh, since the last recession. And since then, we've really been in a point of growth. Uh, it's the longest sustained period of growth for any commercial market in the country. So the Silicon Valley has been since 2011, so we're nine years now of positive growth uh, in our market. And it looks to continue into 2020. Uh, and even into 2021 as well. And so we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. But what we're gonna talk about today uh, is the Silicon Valley landscape, what's going on, what are the biggest points of discussion that tenants are talking about now, uh, the types of leases, something that uh, I call the iceberg, and we'll get to that. Um, I think that's probably the most important part of what we talk about today. And then some things to remember as you're talking to companies that want to start uh, an office, not just here in San Jose or the Silicon Valley, but in the US as a whole things to think about and make sure that you're cognizant of before you enter into a lease agreement. So what's happening in the Silicon Valley right now? Well, first off, as I've said, we've been in a, a period of growth, which is great for the companies here. It's great for, um, it's great for business as a whole and the economy, but it also means that costs have gone up across the board. So not just the cost of rent, which is really the, the top line number that everybody's looking at, how we measure how the real estate market is doing is just that rent number, but really it's the cost of construction, the cost of furniture, the cost of employees. So really everything that has to do with how a company operates a business here in the Silicon Valley and in the US really has been increasing. What we've also seen is that the available inventory has decreased. And even though, as Joanne mentioned, there's cranes everywhere and there's options for people, 
that has not really been enough to accommodate the growth uh, that we've seen. And so companies like Google taking six million feet or building a six million square foot project, the reason that they built or are building that project is because there's not enough uh, real estate to satiate their demand in other areas. So they've basically taken anything that they can in Mountain View, which is where the company was started and grew. Uh, and through that and through some of the benefits that San Jose offers that were touched on in the last presentation, amenities, transportation, housing, they decided to grow in San Jose instead of doing it in Mountain View. And that's, it's not just the story with them. Facebook, Apple, and many other smaller companies who take 100,000 feet instead of six million, not everybody has the appetite that Google does, uh, but that has resulted in a decrease of the inventory. So we've really looked at right now, if you see the cranes that are going around, 70% of the buildings that are being built are already leased. And so once those buildings are done, it's not like that's gonna be on the market and ready for somebody to take. A lot of that's already been taken. And so there is a little bit of a crunch in terms of when you're looking for space, what's actually available for you. And because of this, cost increasing, availability decreasing, flexibility and agility on the part of the tenant is absolutely paramount. And we'll talk about ways that you can be flexible and be prepared to enter into a lease. But that has been the biggest factor in whether or not someone gets a building or doesn't or is able to start a business in the US or cannot is the flexibility and agility and really preparedness to enter into a lease agreement. The decisions that people are making now and why they're taking the buildings that they do are based mostly on what employees want. So these last two things, transportation driven decisions and competition for employees tie in together because as I think you guys mentioned or it was said that you took a bus down from San Francisco, I can't imagine how long that took and if you went you know, right now, you'd probably be in traffic for two hours. So whereas that in 2011 took 45 to 50 minutes to be able to make that commute, now it takes up a quarter of your workday. And because of that, companies are becoming increasingly cognizant, and I think it's probably the first thing that people think about now when they're choosing a new location or opening an office is how are my employees going to get to me? And so the train, Caltrain's a huge example. BART coming into San Jose eventually, when that happens, it's probably you know, five to seven years away. When that spine is connected to downtown San Jose, those things are all going to help. Uh, but for now, there's very few options that are available for people who want to be able to make sure that their employees can get to them on public transportation. So that's why another benefit that San Jose has is they're so connected through Caltrain and the VTA, the bus system, and eventually BART uh, uh, means that San Jose is well positioned for the future when people continue to think about transportation as part of their decision. Competition for employees, it's mentioned what's the cost of housing, what's the cost of, um, or how, how many am amenities are available nearby. People wanna be able to enjoy their work environment, go somewhere where they can go get lunch. Uh, they don't have to bring their lunch. They could see other people. They could live in a community. You know, those things are important. And when you have Facebook and Google and Apple all looking for the same engineers and all talking to the same people, uh, those, uh, those qualities in a building and when you're choosing a space are important to think about, even for small companies, right? Because you're competing against a Facebook or a Google that can pay large salaries, and they have a lot of these amenities that are self-contained within their building. So one of the main points that Joanne asked me to talk about today uh, when I came up and presented was uh, different types of leasing scenarios, or different types of leases, and they can range. These are, this is a small subset of them, but it covers most that are, um, that are out there in the market, especially here in Silicon Valley. And what I did was I arranged them from most flexible on the left to least flexible on the right. And there are benefits to a direct lease. Flexibility is not the only thing that's concerning. You know, Google and Facebook and Apple, the bigger companies, they, they don't do anything but direct leasing. Uh, and there's reasons for that, and we can get into that in a minute um, as I go through. And there's, there's definite disadvantages to being in an incubator and an accelerator too. It depends on the stage of the company that you're in, depends on what you're looking for. So, I'll just go through and, and talk about each one here. Um, probably the most flexible, the earliest stage that your uh, company would be looking for, if they're looking for a lease, they would look at an incubator. And what an incubator is, it's for seed stage companies or companies that have not been seeded yet, which means get, it, get their first round of funding. Uh, they're usually bootstrapped. They're working off the personal capital of whoever founded the company or maybe one or two small investors. Uh, but an incubator, the, the unique thing about that is that usually, in order to join an incubator or to operate in an incubator, you're giving that incubator company, the person who runs the facility, an equity share of your company. 
So that's not always attractive for everyone. Something, that's not something that everybody wants to do, and it's not necessary. But the benefits that they have is that uh, they have connections. They can give you know, early, it's almost like a business school, teach you how to start the business and get through the early parts of you know, opening something here or um, putting a product to market, connecting you with other people who maybe are in the same field and have done it before. So it's a very um, education almost based form of real estate. Accelerator is very similar, but usually the companies that are in an accelerator have already been in an incubator or they're past that first stage of seed funding. And what an accelerator does is, it, well, they, they intend to do exactly what they are called, accelerate the growth from that seed stage into the next stage. The unique part about an accelerator is most accelerators, they don't ask for an equity share, but what they want is uh, a payment on top of the lease uh, for the services that they provide. So. It's similar to co-working in the fact that you'll get a common break room and you'll get reception services and you'll get mail delivery services, things like that. But there's usually a fee that's involved in the guidance and help that they give to that company. Right? So that's an accelerator. Uh, co-working is the hottest topic in terms of real estate, commercial real estate over the last five years. The biggest one being WeWork. WeWork's largest Silicon Valley location is actually right across the street in the towers buildings across. Um, and I, I think a lot of what's happened with WeWork over the last, I guess, you know, two, three months or so has clouded the discussion on co-working, but co-working is a very important and very vital part of the early business stage leasing market. Uh, and it's been around much longer than WeWork has been around. So WeWork is really just the newest hot company that's been doing this, but Regis has been in this space for over 30 years. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time. There's a lot of others. You're going to Common Grounds later today. I saw um, they're right around the corner. Smaller incubator, uh, or excuse me, smaller co-working space. But what co-working provides is flexibility. Uh, and flexibility is very important, especially when you don't know how long you're going to need that space, if you're going to grow, um, if you don't, uh, if you don't know how much space you need, right? There, there's a lot of questions that a company has that they may not know the answer to. And those questions, if you don't have the answer to them early, all that means is you're paying more for uncertainty, right? So if I'm a company and I have four employees and I don't know if I need 5,000 feet to manufacture in the back of the space, or maybe I'm going to use an offsite OEM or a, a, a machine shop to do my manufacturing for you. I don't know that answer right now. Uh, if I do that and I lease a 5,000 square foot space, every square foot that I don't need that I'm paying for is extra and that's cost that's coming out of my business, right? So those are things that you have to think about and co-working provides a solution for that. They sign short-term leases. Some can be as short as a month, uh, depending on the location that you're going to. Um, they could be as long as two years or longer than that if you really enjoy it. That's where WeWork, I think, changed the co-working discussion is they made spaces that people would wanna stay in longer than just a couple months, right? That, that's what their whole goal was to keep people longer. Um, so in the co-working landscape, uh, it, it's very beneficial, but again, flexibility results in cost. And so for a space that you'd lease at WeWork, instead of going to a direct space, the monthly cost is gonna be much higher, but what you're getting for that higher cost is the ability to uh, right size and figure out what you need in the beginning, right? A sublease uh, is a very attractive opportunity for people in this market, and we have a lot of them. Um, I was going to show a slide earlier today. Um, I didn't bring it with me, but 25% of the available inventory in the Silicon Valley right now is sublease space. Some of that's large, you know, bigger spaces that either a company didn't make it, they expected that they were going to and they didn't, so they have that market, that space on the market for sublease, or maybe they grew. Palo Alto Networks is a great example of this. Um, they were in 300,000 feet in Santa Clara. They decided that they needed a million feet, so what did they do with that 300,000 square feet before? They put it on the market for sublease, right? And so subleases are attractive for a number of reasons. First off, uh, they're usually much less expensive than any other option on the market. Um, the reason being, is that uh, usually somebody's trying to get out of it. You don't sublease a space unless you need to. Uh, and so it's either because you're growing or you don't, you're contracting. And so sublease is usually you're catching a company at a time where they're allowing you to pay less than what they're paying on the lease. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is most times the sublease is already built, right? So 
all of the other ones, the co-working, the accelerator, the incubator, they're giving you pre-built spaces. That's the same with the sublease. A sublease space is almost always going to be done, and usually it hasn't been used for the entire term of the lease that they've been in it, so you're getting a new space. And then the last thing that's very important with a sublease is furniture. People don't understand how much furniture actually is. To build out a space, uh, unless you're getting it rented or you're buying it from Ikea, which I have seen people do before, um, furniture can cost about $30 a square foot, right? So for 1,000 square feet, you're looking at $30,000 for furniture, right? So not, not many people understand how much furniture can cost, and that's a big expense. And most subleases, if they're plug and play, that's the big word, they come with the furniture already installed, the wiring already installed, and that's free for you to use while you're in the sublease term. So you can say, oh, subleases sound fantastic. They can be. Some of the bad things about subleases are term lengths, right? Usually it's gonna be shorter than you'd like, a year, six months, 18 months. They're complicated to negotiate because you have another party in the transaction. Um, but that's all stuff that you know a broker can help you with and, and help you through. So subleases are definitely something that's been hot over the last couple of, uh, of months here. And then lastly is the direct lease. Direct lease is the most traditional. You go to a landlord, you ask them for a lease document, you negotiate the terms, and we'll talk about uh, direct leases on the next slide. But those are the least flexible, right? So breaking a, a direct lease usually results in you losing a security deposit or going to court or things like that, right? So there are a lot of things that you need to, uh, to manage and navigate when you're talking about a direct lease. And what do I mean by that? <clears throat> a term I think everybody's familiar with is the tip of the iceberg, right? So we like to call the lease itself the iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg are uh, very small monetary concessions or terms that the landlord's gonna talk to you about, right? So I cannot tell you how many times uh, somebody comes to me and says, I got a great deal because the rent is low and it's short term and I got a month of free rent. Those things can all be great and yes, they matter, right? That's the monetary cost. But in a direct lease and in a sublease too, there are so many other items in the document that are important for you to, to make sure that you understand it. And if you're advising a company or speaking to a company about leasing space, the rent, the free rent, the term, those should be the secondary things that you talk about, right? Th those are not near as important as some of the other items that are in there because they affect the company long after the lease is done during the term of the lease. And these are just some examples. And all of these things I can explain, I'll pick a couple of them, right? So um, one, uh, the improvement dollar sunset clause. So what this means is, say you're a new company, you're opening up a manufacturing facility, and your landlord gives you $100 a square foot to build out your space. Okay, it's a lot of money. And during that time, you're starting your business, and you're figuring out what to do, and you don't know if you need this machine, or how high the ceilings need to be, or any of that type of stuff, and you're working through that process. There's something in a lease called a, uh, a uh, <laughs> improvement dollar sunset clause, and what that means is, if you don't spend that money, within a certain time frame, it goes away, right? So you could be planning to open up your manufacturing facility and you're counting on the money that the landlord is going to give to you in order to start that, start that facility. And because you took too long during that process to plan out the space and do all this, it's gone. And it doesn't change any of the other terms of the lease. They're not going to reduce the rent for you because they took that money away. They're not gonna give you more free rent. That's something that we've run into a lot of times when we get involved later in a transaction, we have to negotiate that out after it's already been consummated, right? So that, that's one thing. Uh, another is a relocation clause. Uh, this is more common in office space. So say you pick out an office space on the third floor of a building, you like the view, you like where it is, it's really well, um, well situated for how you wanna do your business, right? But in your lease, you have a relocation clause. If that landlord decides that they like another tenant better than you in that space, or they have someone who wants the entire floor and you're the last person that's in the way, they could rip up your lease agreement and move you to any other space in the building at their discretion, right? So that's another clause that people just look over. They just don't pay attention because they think they got a good deal and rent and TI and all those other things. So those are things that are very dangerous to a business because think about the fact of I'm in a space, I'm operating in the US, I have three employees and now I'm being relocated. It's going to take six months for the landlord to relocate me. They have to build out a new space it's downtime, right, and it's risk to your business. So those are things that are important to, to know about. Um, other things, yes, yeah, subleasing and assignment clauses. You know, the subleases are attractive because it gives a tenant an out if they don't need the space anymore. 
Um, and if you don't negotiate a favorable sublease and assignment clause for you, there are, uh, there are times where a landlord can come in and say, uh, I don't like the tenant that you want to sublease the space, so I'm gonna say no, right? And that's more cost. It's more marketing time. It's more lost money from paying the rent that you don't need to pay, right? So there's a lot of things that are important to pay attention to in a lease um, uh, that uh, are way more important than the rent and the term, even though, I, again, those things are important, but they, I think they're secondary. So what to remember, and I'll leave some time for questions afterwards, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, so, so what's important to remember, and I'll talk about this in a second. So my role is I'm a tenant representation broker, right? So if someone's coming in, I, I'm not representing landlords. If someone comes in, they need to find a space, I represent them. And what's important is that you have, it's a self-serving comment, but you have someone to represent your interests. Because I hear a lot of times, oh, well, I am using a broker because the landlord has a broker. Well, the landlord's broker is only uh, they're only liable, or not liable, their only interest is to make sure that they're negotiating a good deal on behalf of the landlord. They're not working for you at all, right? So with a tenant broker, you can, you know, what our strategy usually is, is we know that deals have been done in the market, comparable comps, um, you know, leases that we've negotiated before where we say, no, this is market. You have to give this because everybody else gets this, right? And it's usually a trade-off for something else, but what our role is as tenant representation brokers is to advise you on what you can trade, what you should give up for some of these things that are more important in the long run, right? Did that answer your question? Okay. So th things to remember, um, the entire lease matters, not just the rent. I think that's the biggest thing. The entire lease matters. Second, flexible does not equal cancelable. <laughs> so I wanted to leave that uh, with you guys because a lot of people go into WeWork leases, they go into a sublease and they're, oh, it's flexible, it's a short term. That does not mean you can cancel it whenever you want to. And that's something that people get caught on all the time. So even if WeWork tells you or any other uh, co-working operator tells you that it's a flexible office solution, that doesn't mean you can get out whenever you want to. So make sure you read those agreements very carefully. Um, flexibility costs money. So you can get things where you can get in and out in a month but it's better to plan longer term because the more time you need that flexibility, the more money it's gonna cost you. Um, rent is not the only cost of leasing as we just talked about. Uh, there's construction, there's furniture, architecture, legal, and use a tenant broker. Again, it's self-serving, but I think it's one of the most important things to remember is that you need an advocate who's going to, who knows how to do this stuff for you. Uh, and it doesn't have to be CBRE, it doesn't have to be anybody. Just use somebody who knows uh, what uh, commercial lease entails. And I think those are the most important things to remember when you're starting something up. So that's my presentation. If you have any questions, happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you. That was, I, I don't think I've ever seen the, um, the, the, the uh, least flex or most flexible to least flexible oh, uh, timeline. I'm calling it a timeline, <laughs> not a timeline, whatever that's called. But scale. It, scale, scale. Yeah. yeah, so that was really, uh, that was really, really helpful. So thank you. Do we have time for a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So look, I, I was wondering if you might be able to give me a range of, of square feet meterage, say between uh, San Jose and San Francisco. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, San Jose is a much, much larger market uh, than San Francisco is. Just the city of San Jose is larger than San Francisco is. Um, for R&D, it's 240, 000, uh, 240 million feet in the Silicon Valley, right? And then if you go office in the Silicon Valley, it's about 50 million feet. In all of San Francisco, all of it, there's no R&D in San Francisco, it's just office space. You're at about 100 million square feet total. So it's about three times bigger, the Silicon Valley market, than the San Francisco market. Uh, what's the best deal for uh, an international foreign startup to come here and because you said that the accelerator take uh, chairs and the incubator take chairs so yeah. what's what what could be the best deal for them so <laughs> it really depends on what stage you're in right so if you have your business plan already you don't care about you know meeting people or or learning that type of thing you just want to start a business i think the best way to start is in co-working probably 
Um, but if you want to make relationships and you want to maybe identify funding sources, you want US money, uh, investors that are local, um, I think that incubators and accelerators are, are a good way to start. But it's really where you are as a company, more than anything. The last thing I'll mention um, is, is something I meant to put up here. Uh, make sure that you, bef when you start a business, you need to be registered with the California Secretary of State before they allow you to do business in the US. So you could have a lease, you could move into a space, but you can't do anything until you've done that. It costs $50 and it takes about you know two hours to do. So make sure that that's done before you try and do anything in the US. So that was, that's, yeah, one point. Anybody else? All right, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, I appreciate it. You'll be, uh, you'll be around this morning. You'll be around. Okay, great. So Matt will be around for the break and hopefully at lunch too if you have time. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, so be sure to grab Matt. So now we turn our attention to um, what the vice mayor referred to this morning as the secret sauce, um, intellectual property. Uh, so, you know, really that is, uh, that, that's, that's what Silicon Valley is all about, right, um, is, is having that intellectual property, knowing, knowing that you have it, inventorying it, protecting it, and uh, enforcing it. It's, it's absolutely essential to any company's success. San Jose, the city of San Jose, is lucky to be the home of one of just four of the regional offices of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, a bureau of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And today we are joined by Molly Kachowski, who is the director of the Rocky Mountain um, Regional uh, US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, the Silicon Valley office is right around the corner. And after Molly's presentation, we'll be taking a short walk. So you can kind of just look at the lobby and see what's there. And Molly will be telling you about um, the services that are provided by, um, by all the US PTO satellite offices. Um, Molly serves, as I mentioned, as the director of the Rocky Mountain Regional US PTO in Denver. And prior to her career in public service, was a senior patent counsel for Oracle America. Prior to Oracle, Molly worked at Quest and was also in private practice in New York and Colorado, supporting tech firms in IP litigation. Molly, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, goody. Um, save your applause for until after. Uh, <laughs> no, um, welcome to San Jose. I have to say you're getting a two for one deal. So my colleague, John Kabeca, who is the director of the Silicon Valley office, was indisposed today. And he said, hey, why don't you come out to San Jose and see me? So I said, OK, I like it out here. Um, in fact, because the company I used to work for is just down the street. Um, so I really do like it out here. I always like to say that, you know, um, we as the regional directors will talk about intellectual property to anybody, anytime. Um, so, but this works best if it's a conversation. I have a couple of things that I think will surprise you about the services that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office offers to all of its stakeholders. Um, but I think um, this will work better as a conversation. The only thing that I have to tell you is that they are filming, so we want the person with the microphone to be able to get to you before you ask the conversation. So I hate to say it, but you're gonna have to raise your hand like you're in class again all those years ago. Um, one of the interesting things, and I thought it was very interesting that Chris said earlier, um, I don't know if you noticed on one of Chris's slides that he said that Silicon Valley, in fact, this region has the most patents issued to any US metro area, bar none. Um, and, and actually, I think if we compare that across the world, the only other place where we might be beat out is, is in uh, various places in China. Um, because Silicon Valley really is the home of just a lot of intellectual property. Nope, that's it. Okay. Um, like Joanne said, I am the Rocky Mountain Office Regional Director, so um, there are, I, I think I want you to take two points from that. I, again, I'm not from Silicon Valley. Um, but one of the things, all of the resources that I'm talking about are available not just here at Silicon Valley, but they're available in all of our regional offices, as well as at our headquarters in Alexandria. But I think by being co-located with companies, it's, it's actually kind of 
done some synergy with companies and helping them understand intellectual property a little bit better, helping them learn the language, and then helping them protect themselves, their products, and their revenue a little bit better. So what is the US Patent and Trademark Office? Um, we are the federal agency that grants US patents um, and registers US trademarks. We advise the president and federal agencies on intellectual property issues. Um, and we work to promote stronger intellectual property protection around the world. Our mission is to foster innovation um, because innovation and intellectual property go hand in hand. Does everybody know what I mean when I talk about intellectual property? Does any, right? Okay, so that's that intellectual property is the umbrella term for patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. So there is no agency in the world that registers trade secrets because you're supposed to keep them secret, right? Okay, all right, there we go. Um, but, right, for copyrights, it's the US Copyright Office, our colleagues over in the Library of Congress. And then for trademarks and patents, it's the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, we have five offices around the nation. Our headquarters is in Alexandria. We do boast being one of the oldest agencies in the nation, um, the US Patent and Trademark Office kind of in its current form, started in the 1800s. Um, but our first patent act in the United States was in 1790, and Thomas Jefferson was our first patent examiner. So we have a very, very rich history with the United States, and we also like to say, you know, the intellectual property system in the United States is one of the most robust in the world, both from an, an obtaining of intellectual property as well as enforcement. Um, and we think that one of that, one of the reasons for that is the protections that we're able to offer to innovators. So we opened up four regional offices in the last, I'm gonna, what is it, seven years now? Um, our first regional office opened up in Detroit in 2012. The next one was my office in Denver in 2014, then Silicon Valley, and then Dallas. And one of the reasons that we did that was, um, in its wisdom, Congress told us that uh, they thought that innovation wasn't only occurring in Washington, D.C. Um, depending on who you talk to, you can figure out whether or not innovation is occurring at all. But right, they wanted us to be closer to where innovators are so that we have and innovators have the ability to have those conversations about intellectual property, why it's important, why it matters, and how to access the system. So that's one of the things that we do. Um, you are sitting in part of the home of the Silicon Valley Regional Office. In fact, you're just going to go out to your left a little bit. Um, and every single regional office has exam patent examiners um, that do the work of examining the patent applications in accordance with U.S. laws for novelty, non-obviousness, um, uh, usefulness, and then also written description, um, whether or not it's enabled. Um, so they do that work. Um, actually, Silicon Valley is one of the few offices, regional offices, that also has design patent examiners. So they are the people who are evaluating the ornamental features of a device in those patent applications. We also have patent trial and appeal board judges. You can think of them as kind of that second look so if you get to the point with an examiner where the examiner says it's not patentable, you think it is, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board judges will act as arbitrators of that dispute and they will come up with a decision. They also take a look at the patents after they've been issued if somebody comes up with new prior art or if they come up with a new reason why that patent shouldn't have issued in the first place. So those are our Patent Trial and Appeal Board judges. We have those in the um, Silicon Valley office. They're also in actually every regional office. And then we have management and support staff. So two of them are standing in the back, Stephen Koziel and Ken Takeda. Um, Ken is one of the regional outreach officers for the US Patent and Trademark Office here in Silicon Valley. And Stephen is the assistant regional director. So their job, at least 50% of their job, um, probably more like actually 100 for Ken, but 50 for Stephen is to make sure that we're doing the outreach to stakeholders to make sure that they understand and they have access to the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, does anyone have any questions yet? OK. Uh, so outreach services, um, walk-in services. Uh, Silicon Valley boasts a very, very, very nice facility that you're about to see. 
where you can just walk in and ask an intellectual property question pretty much, um, well, during business hours. I was going to say 24-7, but I don't want to do that to you guys. Uh, there are workstations for searching patents and trademarks. I think when I was a patent attorney, the, the worst thing I ever had to say to somebody was, that's a great idea, and here's the guy that did it before you did. Um, and it was really bad when you have to say that after they've already invested money. So you want to say those words and find that prior art and do that searching prior to people adopting their brand names or prior to people um, actually investing money in R&D and research and putting um, investment dollars towards things that are already patented. So we have workstations for searching patents and trademarks. Um, there is a regional focus for conferences. Every region is a little bit different. Um, as you guys might imagine, my region has a lot of agriculture, um, a lot of farming. Uh, National Western Stock Show is going on in Denver right now. Um, but right, so we, we each have that regional flair for what's going on in our region and an expertise that's pretty deep about the technology and things that are going on. Uh, we have a hearing room to host patent trial and appeal board proceedings. Um, we also have remote access so that if your company is a party to those proceedings, you get to watch that from any one of the regional offices. So, for example, when I worked down the street, um, we had the requirement of going to any hearing. And so, back then, I had to travel back to Washington, D.C. every time we had a hearing. That was horrible. I was sick all the time because of those airplane thingies. So, <laughs> um, I was not a happy camper about that. I would have loved being able to just drive down the street and, and attend a hearing and see what was going on there. We also have interview rooms to connect applicants to patent examiners across the country. While most of your patent examination takes place on paper, I always like to tell people that patent examiners, I, they really are people too. And it helps if you talk to them um, because sometimes you and I can think of things very differently. So it, there's a screw holding this light socket or this outlet on the wall. See, you might call that a screw. Um, the patent examiner might think of that as a removable or semi-permanent fastener. And so you'd be talking in two different languages. And so sometimes it helps to just get the examiner um, either on the phone or I actually prefer um, a WebEx where I get to see your face, you get to see mine, and then that way you know. Sometimes the dog is still in the background because it's a conference call, right? But anyway, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that we allow people to do from our regional offices. We also have a patent examiner technical training program. We like to believe that we have one of the greatest technically trained workforces in the nation. Um, and this might surprise you. The US Patent and Trademark Office actually has about 13,000 employees across the United States. Um, we have employees in every state except for Wyoming and North Dakota. Uh, no, actually, and here's the funny thing, like North Dakota actually has the fastest um, fiber optic speed in the nation. I think it's the winter though. <laughs> I'll just say that because I don't even, North Dakota's in my territory and I don't even go in the winter time. Um, but our patent examiner technical training program allows companies that are doing cutting edge research to come in and teach the examiners about that research. So for example, uh, we had the National um, Renewable Energy Labs out to the Denver office to teach people about some of the solar cells and things that were going on in their research laboratories there. I know that you've had people from Stanford and from, um, and I think on artificial intelligence and others. So if there's a topic, if there's something that one of your companies that you represent or your company um, is doing that you think the examiners would benefit from being trained on, please do reach out to the regional office and let them know about that. Because um, our examiners love it. Um, you know, most, about two-thirds of our agency, so about two-thirds of those 13,000 people across the nation are patent examiners. Every single patent examiner, along with every patent attorney, has a scientific background. So I was a chemical engineer before I went to law school. Um, 
And then, but most of them have, and a lot of them, especially in certain areas, have advanced degrees. So if they're working in the biotech area, right, you're most likely dealing with a PhD. So they love the tech and they love to learn about it. And that's one of the things that is a great benefit um, of having them right here too. So uh, the public interview room, um, we've given you just a couple of pictures on how that looks. Um, like I said, I like that face-to-face, -face, um, number one, because then I know that you're not multitasking and you're paying attention to me. <laughs> so that's one of the things. And then I think one of the reasons to use the interview room, especially in the regional offices, is sometimes firewalls get in the way um, and you might have buffering or bandwidth issues or anything like that. Because it's all right here and it's all our systems, we also have on-site help to help you make sure that that experience goes smoothly. Um, our universal public workstations, this is where you get access to Pub East and Pub West. Um, these two databases are not available commercially. So when you are doing patent prior art searching, you want to be using the same databases that the patent examiners use. And I'll go back to my screw example because if you're using something that's available on the internet, it's usually a natural language search. Everybody's familiar with that, right? You just type it into your whatever search engine you want and it comes up with something. So you might call something a screw, but all of the prior art relates to that semi-permanent or removable fastener that I talked about. So you need to be able to search the patent examiner databases because then you can search the US and international classifications that go along with the prior art and the patents. So it's super important. Patent prior art searching is kind of like the, everybody remember the line from Shrek about the onion, right? Where you peel back a layer and you peel back a layer and it, that's exactly what patent prior art searching is like. Um, but it really helps to use the patent examiner databases. Let's see. So we also have a network of public libraries, um, just in case you don't happen to be co-located with one of our regional offices. They are called Patent, Trademark, and Resource Centers. Um, they actually kind of act as that public face when we can't be present, um, but they have access to East and West. They have access to those databases, and they also have librarians who are experts to help you through those, those kinds of searching. We have located all of our startup resources in one um, web page. I think it's really fantastic. It's absolutely, it's kind of like one-stop shopping. Um, and again, all you really need to take away from this presentation is if you have intellectual property questions, call one of the regional offices. Um, because, and, and I totally recognize how this sounds, but we are here to help. Um, we are invested in our stakeholders. We believe in our stakeholders. We want to see them succeed. And you have the expertise of, of thousands of U.S. Patent and Trademark employees right there. Um, so we have all of our startup resources in one website, which I really like. We'll talk a little bit about a couple more of those. Um, our Trademark Assistance Center, they are open a lot, um, 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, and you can just call and ask questions about trademarks. Um, we obviously can't provide you advice about what marks to file, but we can walk you through searches. We can walk you through what certain things mean and whether or not it might have an impact. We can't make any guarantees, though. Um, but they are really good, especially if you have a trademark application that's kind of hung up in the system somewhere. But you can also call the regional offices to do that. Our Inventors Assistance Center, same thing. Um, we, we make these hotlines available for people just so that they're able to follow up on where their intellectual property is in the system. Let's see, our Patent Pro Bono Program, this is a actually relatively new thing. Uh, for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, it started up around the same time the American Vents Act did, so about 2012. Um, this is where we match under-resourced inventors with patent attorneys who will help the under-resourced inventor for free. So you apply through California Lawyer for the Arts. There are some requirements. I think it's 300% of the poverty level for the state that you happen to live in. but. 
It is a really, really fantastic program that I think helps ensure access to the system. Because 90% of the cost of a patent application in the United States goes to the lawyers. It's, it's their fees for writing the application. And they're essential. Um, like I said, language is one thing. Um, we also have, being that we trace our history back to 1790, there are some claim strategies, and claims are the numbered paragraphs at the end of the patent, um, that actually like set out what the patent covers. Those numbered paragraphs are really important. We have some claiming strategies that are still left over from 1790. So it's kind of important. You can lose a lot if you're trying to represent yourself. But if you are representing yourself, we also have a pro se art unit. Um, so pro se in Latin means for yourself. Pro bono in Latin means for the good of others. So, um, but the, our pro se art unit um, is really fantastic and they help people who are representing themselves. They get a little bit of extra time and they get extra training in helping people through that. We also have law school certifications. Um, I think actually California boasts the most um, law school clinics. Um, some are trademarks only, some are patents. Um, a lot of them have an entrepreneurial focus as well to help um, uh, startups and entrepreneurs get through the intellectual property process. In order to make the system more accessible too, we established a micro entity status. Um, so usually we follow the Small Business Administration definition of what a small entity is. So if you have less than 500 employees, you're a small entity in the United States. Um, for the US Patent and Trademark Office fees, our large entity, they pay full fare. Um, for small entities, they get a 50% discount. The micro entity get a 75% discount. So these are some of the things, but I think the biggest part of that is to file a provisional application is $70 for a micro entity. Um, and a provisional application, it really has no requirement. It's um, a placeholder for people. So for example, if your clients or you are going to be presenting at CES, and you do not have a US application on file, you are actually starting a time clock from a patent perspective. And from CES, when you exhibited your wares, that is what's called a public disclosure under US law. Um, if you sold something at CES that is also starting that time clock um, in the United States, you have one year from the date that you start that time clock to file your US patent application. And so it is really, really important to be able to access provisional applications in that sense. And that's why that $70 entry fee makes it a no-brainer to get a provisional application on file, hopefully, before you present or publicly sell. Um, but since CES happened last week, that cat might already be out of the bag. Um, those are just a few of the requirements for micro-entity status. Um, I think the biggest one to remember there is that the person who is claiming um, microentity status can't be named as an inventor on more than four applications. Now, if they worked for a different company and assigned patent applications to a different company, that doesn't count against them. But the four, it's the microentity status really is to encourage people to start filing patents early. Um, but then you would progress to small entity and, and then hopefully back up to large entity. If you really need to fast track your patent, um, we do allow you to do that for the payment of a fee. Um, this does go along with the large, small, and micro entity, but um, you really can get a patent in the United States in less than a year, um, which is screaming fast. I think from the time that you file your application, to the time that we grant it is about two months. From the time that we grant the petition to the time that the application gets a final disposition is hovering around seven months. Um, so it's screaming fast and it helps a lot with, especially if you're going out and courting, um, if you're going out and courting investor dollars, um, sometimes they really wanna see that issued US patent um, before they'll invest. So this is a great way to move that along. Our patent ombudsman program, um, again, if you happen to get into the process and there's something that happens that you're not understanding, 
Um, the patent ombudsman is there as kind of a safety net for you, but the regional offices are also here to help you do all of those things. These are all of our resources. Um, the one that I really like is the one that we developed with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's that IP awareness assessment tool. I think the one thing that people completely miss in their businesses is some of the most obvious intellectual property um, that they need to protect and use. Um, but uh, the IP awareness assessment will take you through a business and in about 20, 25 minutes, we'll give you kind of that list of things that could qualify for intellectual property protection that you can then take a look at. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> and thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> uh, thank you, and, th and thank you very much for the presentation. So from, from I mean, you mentioned one of the topics is artificial intelligence. And one of the things that really interested to hear your views on is that um, with software as well as with algorithm, algorithms, as well as with choosing particular coding languages, it seems to me that it's, it's very easy to distinguish from prior art with simple modifications to, to source code or relatively simple changes to algorithms. Um, maybe. So software is an interesting beast from a technology and, and from an intellectual property perspective, right? So if you, if you actually take, I'll just use the phone that might be in some people's hands, right? Um, every single form of intellectual property exists in that phone, probably in multiple different places. So when you're talking about software, software is available for protection under the Copyright Act. It's also available for protection under patents. Um, right, and there's actually a pretty well-known case pending before the Supreme Court right now um, that might involve two Silicon Valley companies um, talking about what copyright actually covers from a software perspective. So yes, you may be able to come up with differences in the code that would allow you around or through some copyright issues but then you have to see whether or not there are any patents on that particular on that particular set of code because copyright protects the expression of an idea, right? So if I have software that accomplishes A, B, C, and D, right? Um, that's and I write it in Java, let's say, yep. um, and then someone else has the same software but they write it in C plus. Right, two different copyrights, even if it does exactly the same thing. But the people who own the software might have filed a patent on A, B, C, and D. Patents protect the functionality. It protects how something works and you know, kind of how it gets to a result. So it, you could be completely clear on a copyright issue and still violating someone's intellectual property from a patent perspective. Does that make sense? Right? So yes, artificial intelligence can help you with that. And actually, the US Patent and Trademark Office is looking at how artificial intelligence can actually help us get better mm -hmm. at searching prior art and doing a lot of those other kinds of things. Um, as of right now, um, there are no patents where AI is the inventor. Um, you still have to be a human being to be an inventor. Um, so, but right, um, we're, we're definitely looking at all of those issues and, and seeing where it can help us get better, but also where it can help others, um, especially people who are innovating, get better. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, in the back with the coffee cup that I'm really jonesing for right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask about the mechanism of um, getting from a US patent to a worldwide protected patent. Oh, good question. Okay, so intellectual property in all of its forms, with the perhaps exception of trade secret, is global. That means you can obtain intellectual property in any country that you wish. Um, but it is territorial, especially from an enforcement perspective. So if you want to enforce intellectual property in the United States, you must have an intellectual property right in the United States. If you want to enforce in Canada, you must enforce, you must have an intellectual property right in Canada. Does that make sense? So global, but territorial. 
Um, the way that you go through to worldwide patent, um, wow. Uh, so there's several treaties and mechanisms that allow you to claim priority either from a foreign country or from the United States to a foreign country. Um, they're relatively complicated and expensive um, in terms of how you do that. So there are a number of companies that will look at where they're going to be selling um, and where they can enforce. Um, and so, uh, you know, there might be a country, for example, that's in the middle of a civil war right now, and maybe they don't have any judges. So is it really worth getting a patent in that country if you can't enforce it, right? So it, it's one of those things where um, if, if you're looking at trying to protect yourself worldwide from an intellectual property perspective, you really want to have somebody that's there with you, um, helping you walk that journey that's partnering with you and that's making sure that you're focusing on the right things. Um, if you are importing or exporting, right, one thing to consider is where do you have to go into a port? So, for example, if you're going to sell in Europe, one of the biggest ports is Sweden. Um, so you'll see a lot of people file patents in Sweden because then you can use Swedish customs and border protection or the equivalent to help you enforce your intellectual property rights and you can stop goods before they enter the marketplace. Um, because honestly, out of everything that you're ever going to do in terms of protecting your revenue and your company's innovations, if you can stop competitors and knockoffs from getting to the marketplace, you're in the best position there. So, and that is actually one of the things that the U.S. Customs and Border Protection does. Um, they, with, for a patent, you actually have to have a judgment, um, but for a trademark or a copyright, you can register a trademark or a copyright with U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and they'll stop things at the border um, before it enters the United States. Thank you. Um, my friend who works for CBP likes to call that the best deal in government. I kind of agree with him because you get to hire every single customs and border protection for $295 per in piece of intellectual property. It's a deal. It really is. One, do I have time for one last question? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, and I just, I admire that mauve. That is very nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to make intellectual property on that then. Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, submitting an, uh, prop intellectual property is good, but drafting the intellectual property is most important. Do you help uh, drafting or do you have any entities that we can trust to draft first the intellectual property and then submitting it? So we, we can help you avoid the people that you need to avoid. Um, uh, we do not make recommendations um, and we can't give advice. The only time that you will get help from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in drafting is if you are representing yourself. Um, like I said, there are issues that go along with that. Um, while you are not required to have an attorney to practice in front of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, um, I always like to think of it as you're protecting the biggest assets that your company might ever have. Um, you know, because intellectual property is an asset just like a chair. Um, it's monetizable, you can do with it whatever you want, it's licensable, all those other things. So if you're creating the biggest asset that your company might have, do you really want to trust to fate <laughs> sometimes? Um, so I, I always think it's a good idea when you're talking about intellectual property to find a law firm or um, an attorney who will partner with you. Um, we keep a registration database of all of the registered patent attorneys in the United States. At any one given time, there's about 40,000 of us um, that are available to, to help um, in every single discipline and do your homework. Um, I always used to say to people, especially when I was back in my law firm private practice days, you know, you're going to know me for a good long while, um, you know, because a patent usually takes anywhere from one to three years to get through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. You know, people have romantic relationships that last a lot less than that. So, right, interview, 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 interview. Find someone you're comfortable with. Find someone who's willing to walk that journey with you. Um, make sure they're licensed before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, if you can't find it, I know Ken knows exactly where that is. Um, but I'll tell you, one of the worst days of my life in this job was when I had to tell someone who had used one of those late night 
advertisement people. Um, and he started putting papers in front of me and I knew in an instant that they were fake. And he had spent $30,000 with this company and he had nothing to show for it. So do your homework. Um, the, the same way that you do it in hiring an employee, when you're hiring your patent attorney or your intellectual property attorney, really do your homework. Make sure that you're comfortable with that person. Make sure that they have the right background and experience to help you. Um, and luckily for you, it's Silicon Valley. Um, I'm pretty sure you can't go too far without tripping over a patent attorney here. Thank you. <laughs> Now you'll be around for yep. the break. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay. And I want to also, I also have yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, good. Um, these are our inventor trading cards. So <laughs> we oh, think that you. inventors are just as cool as baseball players. <laughs> inventor trading cards. I love it. Um, well, <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, just one second, staying on the on the, the topic of customs and border protection and USPTO um, and how they fit together. If, if you are here in the Bay Area, and I know we have a couple um, members of the Consul Corps and some other companies here today too, on February 13th uh, in this building, actually next door where you're about to go in about a minute, um, we're going to be having a Stop Fakes uh, workshop, it's which a is great program. Yeah. It's yeah. true. Yeah. It's really great. Yes, it's it's a fantastic program. It's all day, uh, and uh, we have every federal agency that touches in any aspect, in any way, on intellectual property. Uh, they are there, including Customs and Border Protection, and you actually can get your laptops out and you do your um, recordation there with Customs and Border Protection. You have opportunities to do one-on-ones. As you know, it's all it's a it's a fantastic uh, program. So that's on February 13th here in San Jose. Um, so a couple of quick housekeeping. That we, we I see our next speaker, Dr. Richard Dasher, is here uh, from Stanford. So uh, we will start. Make sure he start his presentation on time. We're going to have a quick uh, walk next door, just so you can kind of see the lobby of the um, of the PTO office. Um, and Ken and Steve, I think, will be taking us over there. Uh, I want to just a couple housekeeping things really quick. For those who drove down this morning for your parking validation. Um, you'll want to have your ticket, you can write your name on your ticket, uh, and then uh, you can give it to Joe Hedges with the City of San Jose, and those parking uh, tickets will be validated by the city. Um, the PowerPoints, the PowerPoints will be available. We will be sending those out to everybody by the end of this week, so both from the San Francisco Day as well as um, is here in San Jose today. And then last but not least, make sure that you grab one of the City of San Jose t-shirts on your way out if you don't have one already. All right, so uh, we'll have a quick break. We'll be back in 10 minutes, and we can follow Ken. Thank you. All right, I hope everyone had a chance to kind of stretch their legs and go have a look at the USPTO lobby. Um, our next speaker is here. Um, and we're delighted to have Dr. Richard Dasher from Stanford University join us this morning. Um, like uh, the topics that we heard from heard about a little bit ago, real estate and intellectual property, certainly no discussion of Silicon Valley would be complete without talking about Stanford University uh, and the impact that Stanford has had uh, on this region, which has been uh, historic uh, and tremendous. Probably it's safe to say that without Stanford, this region would very, very well have developed on an entirely different uh, trajectory. Fortunately, uh, with Stanford University's very active role as not only an educational institution, but um, community leader, um, a funding uh, entity, a, a counselor to, uh, to startups and businesses and entrepreneurs, uh, and a catalyst, uh, so uh, much of this type of activity, um, fortunately, because Stanford has done all these things and continues to do so today, we benefit, uh, we in the world really benefit from Stanford's uh, many activities in this area. So here to share his insights into what makes this region so unique is Dr. Richard Dasher from Stanford University's US-Asia Technology 
Management Center. Dr. Dasher has led the center since 1994 and served previously as the executive director at the Center for Integrated Systems at Stanford's School of Engineering from 1998 to 2015. Dr. Dasher advises startups, accelerators, venture capital, uh, venture capital firms, and nonprofits across the Silicon Valley and also in China, Japan, and South Korea. Dr. Jasher, thank you for joining us. Joanne, thank you. And thanks everyone for uh, coming this morning. I'm going to talk really not about a marketing pitch. This whole presentation is intended as an answer to the question of what can my company get out of Silicon Valley? I have a lot of people who are interested in expanding to the US and they have heard a lot about Silicon Valley, but they don't really understand how the system works here. So that's the focus of my talk this morning. We'll talk a little bit about the basics of the valley. Then we'll talk about how Silicon Valley focuses on rapid growth for the companies that are housed here, including exit patterns, because they're very important to the whole Silicon Valley system. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about Silicon Valley and open innovation, which you can think of as the relationships between big companies, no matter whether they're located here or whether they're somewhere else, and uh, startup companies, mostly startup companies here. So um, this is a follow-on to the presentation that immediately preceded me. Uh, this region accounts for about 15% of all of the new U.S. patents every year. And uh, that's with about 2% of the U.S. population. So you see that it's an indication of a really in innovation-intensive economy. That's true. We're always looking for the next new thing. Um, but the second factor that's obvious here is Silicon Valley is very expensive. Wages are about twice the national average in the United States. And certainly, uh, I think everybody will get a copy of the slides, okay? So I'm, you're welcome to take pictures, but don't worry, you can get a copy. Um, and the next indication of Silicon Valley being expensive is that office costs are extremely high here. This is from 2017, and actually I think that now San Francisco exceeds New York and is the most expensive place to rent office space in uh, the United States. So why would you bring a company here? Why would you try to start a company here? Why would you care about Silicon Valley? One question is, is it the uh, talent? And if it's the talent, what's really here? You can get an engineer to go to a great project almost anywhere. If they're excited enough about the project, they'll move somewhere. You can get an entrepreneur in any population. Um, there's a huge amount of venture capital here, but also a lot of the venture capital is being invested um, in other places in the United States. I've got a couple of slides on these. So one question is, what's talent here? The second question is, what about the venture capital? And then the last question is culture. All right, so we need to talk about all three of these. So one interesting phenomenon is that if you look at the number of new companies created per 100,000 people in the population every year, Silicon Valley is not so different from other innovation regions in the United States. It's really hard to find a pattern in that graph. So there are entrepreneurs everywhere. That's the point. This is the rate of new venture formation. The, with regard to the, the uh, venture capital, yes, this is huge, right? 45% of all of the venture capital investments in the United States happened in the Silicon Valley region last year. Uh, this is um, a huge amount of money, but it is true that some of these, the, you know, the VCs are flying on their private jets all around the country and, and looking at interesting uh, things to invest in all over the place, including in Asia and including in Israel and including in Europe. So uh, that's not the whole story. If you really look at what's going on here, you see a fascinating pattern in history. 
The very first time the word Silicon Valley was ever used was 1971. And the whole system actually precedes that. But since 1971, you see these major new industry waves that happen every seven or eight years. And uh, Silicon Valley will have one or two of the new world leading companies in each one of these waves. So I ran out of space, but I think I would put mobile information technology down underneath this. And there I would not only put things like Uber and Lyft, I would put um, Tesla Motors itself. It's a, basically a mobile data center. Uh, anyway, you have these kinds of, these, this pattern going on. Now, when we studied the growth patterns of some of the Silicon Valley stu superstar companies, you see that every year for their first 10 year of sales, they're growing by somewhere around 100%. That's doubling in size every year, or even increasing faster in terms of numbers of employees every year. This is um, not what happens to every company here, but it's the model for everybody here. Everyone here is really, I would say, obsessed with rapid growth. How can you grow the, the uh, value of the stock in your company as quickly as possible, as much as possible? So uh, this is what it looks like. As companies go through rounds of funding, you will see that everybody, the investors, the entrepreneurs, and the people who work in the company are really interested in seeing the company value grow. And of course, as you sell off stock, Gradually, the company stops being owned by the entrepreneur and eventually is owned by the public. So the exit can happen either through IPO or it can happen by being acquired by a big company. This is uh, Silicon Valley's culture in a nutshell. How can you make this path grow as much as possible? So here's a good case study to show you what I'm talking about. Square started in 2009. Jack Dorsey was uh, the CEO of Twitter who had been let go by his investor board of directors because they didn't think he was right for the company. So he had a lot of money and a lot of time with two friends. He founded this uh, company that was doing um, credit card payment processing and made it possible for anyone, even an individual, to accept a credit card payment. Um, so their first real funding was about uh, November 2009. They started their service within six months. You'll notice that they got a major round of funding about every year. This is something that doesn't seem to be written down anywhere, but most of the time the investors will give a company about as much money as they think it will use over the next year or so. So uh, you can see if a company is on track if it's getting funding every year or two. Anyway, you see the amount of money is just going incredibly high. They had 150 employees by the second year of their company. They were processing a billion dollars of credit card payments. They probably kept about 1% as their gross revenue. They had to pay the credit card fee. They had to pay other costs out of that uh, one billion. So um, they probably had about $10 million of real revenue. Within the next year, they had trebled in size and they had increased the number of credit card payments they accepted by eight times. This continued for another year, and finally they went IPO. Now, interesting thing is when they went IPO, it was at a lower price than their last round of venture capital funding, so everybody said, how terrible. The current price of Square is somewhere around 65 or $66 on the New York Exchange. So they're not doing too badly. <laughs> uh, and if you see these companies have you know, bad IPOs or whatever, you shouldn't get too excited about it because uh, what really matters is what happens after that. But it's true that after their exit, they're somebody else's company. Jack Dorsey is still the CEO of Square. Uh, he has... Uh, he went back to be CEO of Twitter again, but he's just recently left Twitter. But even though there's all sorts of 
you know, very sophisticated games people play in terms of voting stock versus non-voting stock and so forth. Basically, it's not his company. It's the public's company now. And this is a very important thing to realize in the whole Silicon Valley system. People create things that they gradually transfer to somebody else. Um, so this is really the summary of the first part of my talk. Everyone is obsessed with rapid growth. We have a very highly mobile labor market that makes this easy to happen. People in Silicon Valley companies are working overtime that far matches anything I ever heard about Japan when I was young, during the bubble era of Japan. People are working more overtime here than just about anywhere else. People will spend more time in hiring patterns. Uh, to get a job in a Silicon Valley company, you may have to go through five or six interviews. Uh, and you will also see rapid changes in business models for the sake of aiming at higher growth. So this is, this is one point. And as the company gradually becomes owned by the investors, it's the investors that really push this. In a lot of Asian countries, I see an S-curve. I see a rapid growth period, and then the entrepreneur kind of gets comfortable. And they may still own more than 50% of the shares of the stock after it goes public in an Asian country, and growth tapers off. Not here. They aim to keep growing as quickly as possible. Uh, so the exit point is really critical to the system. Not only does it put a lot of money back into the system, if the venture capitalists can't sell their uh, company stock at five or six times what they paid for it, uh, they really can't keep their limited partners happy. So it puts money back into the system. It puts people back into the system. The people who work here, not just the entrepreneurs, are so familiar with this rapid growth chaos, they get so they kind of like it. They prefer that to the kind of more constrained environment of a big company that has um, excellent business processes worldwide. So it's kind of chaotic, and, and when you see the key people after an acquisition, after a big company buys a startup, when those people's required contract time to stay in the big company is over, they almost always leave. And they either start their next company or they become an investor. Um, so this is, this is one of the things that makes Silicon Valley unique, is widespread knowledge of this whole growth and exit cycle for startup companies. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting. This is America-wide. If you look at the history of exits in the US, you see that with a lot of variation depending on the state of the economy, it's still not too different for venture capital backed companies. Uh, 50 or 60 of them will go public every year in the US. More in good years, less in, in bad years. What has changed is the number of companies that are acquired by a big firm. That's how they exit. So on the one hand, you see the maturing of the venture capital industry in this. If you talk to a venture capitalist, they will say, we expect 30% of our investments to go bust. We don't get anything. We have 1% of the companies, 50 or 60 all across the United States that will go public. These are the equivalent of home runs in baseball. So what they've done is they've made a much better return on the majority of their investments in the middle by selling them to large firms. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing because M&A is often the best way for a startup company really to achieve their vision of changing the world. They can... Um, you know, gain the marketing and distribution clout and the brand value of the acquiring firm. But more interesting than the first two points is that this says something about the big companies in the U.S. So the big companies are looking at the startup companies here as partners for a particular kind of innovation. Um, if they don't engage with startup companies sufficiently, 
the big companies kind of become a little bit too stodgy. They become too isolated, unaware of the new trends that are going on outside their company. So this is the process of open innovation, and this is what we're going to talk about for the next part of the talk. For a big company, um, you have to uh, really you know, have lots of ideas that you think about so that you will take only a few of them to real-world deployment. So this is a process that happens over and over again. A big company cannot stop innovating. It dies if it does. Now, in order to innovate sufficiently, you have to consider more things further away from the market in the future than you will ever take to market. A big company will spend 90% of its R&D budget on D. They will spend another 10% looking at uh, other possibilities, typically inside their R&D group. Now, um, what open innovation is, is where you're looking for ideas and knowledge from outside the company that you want to combine with what knowledge you have inside your company in order to strengthen your innovation pipeline. So it's more efficient to work with the outside than it is to try to do everything inside your company. This is a change that's happened in American industry over the last 35 years. In the early 1980s, of all of corporate spending on R&D, only 4% of spending was done by small entities. By the year 2005, 25% of national corporate spending on R&D was done by small entity companies in the U.S., which means that as a nation, we depend more and more on the startups. Um, so what we did in our center at Stanford is look at just what kind of relationships are going on. So Google is a great example. Google spent almost, or I'm sorry, Alphabet, spent almost $24 billion on R&D internally last year. That was about 16% of revenues, which is not too far out of line with other companies in the software industry. But Google just announced that they're going to buy Fitbit for $2.1 billion. That's big enough that it's clearly not something planned way up in here. They want Fitbit right now to compete against Apple Watch. Uh, Google also buys 20 or 20, Alphabet also buys 20 or 25 startup companies every year. We don't know how much technology licensing they do, but they actually buy the firms and probably spend a couple of billion dollars buying up firms every year. They have their own corporate venture capital, which is not buying to own, spending money to own. You're spending money to watch somebody else's company gr to grow, to be involved as the startup company grows. That's typically further out. Google's spending somewhere around 400 or $500 million a year um, on um, corporate venture capital. Their main fund is GV, but they also have a couple of other funds uh, that are specific to particular areas of artificial intelligence. Google spends about 50 or $60 million a year, notice that's million, not billion, supporting university research worldwide. So you see the pattern. You spend less further out, and having control over what happens is less important than seeing somebody else's perspective into something new on the way out. So this is the way open innovation works. We did a study of the voice assistants, virtual assistants. I'm not going to read all of this. But notice that Apple did not invent Siri. Apple bought Siri. It was a research project at SRI. Note that Amazon started Alexa as part of their speaker project in their kind of far out lab, Lab 128. But they uh, had made venture capital investments in three companies and bought three. Actually, they make other VC investments too, but they bought up the rest of the stock in three of their um, venture capital invested companies in order to make Alexa happen. So every single one of those examples have some sort of an external relationship in the uh, development of the voice assistant. Yeah, so uh, this is what I was trying to remember about Alphabet. 
what I just said while I was going through the pattern. And I think the important thing is to consider why a company does this. You aren't just looking for something that's cheaper that's, than what you can do inside your company. That's really sort of a big motivation for outsourcing. What you're looking for with open innovation is something different from what you're doing inside your company. It's either an unexpected big opportunity or it's an opportunity that might disrupt your existing business. Now there's theory behind both of these. Uh, I gave a talk on open innovation a few years ago and the next speaker was the head of open innovation for Procter & Gamble. And he said, oh, Professor Dasher, you have a nice model. We only do this if it's going to be a big win in the market because the risks are higher when you're working with somebody on the outside. Uh, the second point about disruptive innovation goes into work by Professor Christensen up at Harvard, who does a great job of saying what startup companies can do that big companies don't. Uh, he divides risk into two major types. There's execution risk, what he calls technology risk. This is the risk that your new development project will fail. The other risk is market risk. That's the risk that even if you come up with something new, the market won't like it. So when one of those types of risk is low, the big companies will spend money on that. It's easy to justify that. The new cars, every year, new car companies come out. When the big car companies looked at electric vehicles, they uh, picked around town cars, things where the technology maybe wasn't that hard and they knew the market really well. They picked something that would replace an existing car type. It took the crazy people at Tesla Motors to try to start off with an electric sports car. There had never been an electric sports car. Uh, so even if you could do the technology and achieve the, the rapid acceleration and the performance that they were aiming at, would anybody spend $110,000 for a car that you don't even change gears? It doesn't even sound like a sports car. So that's the theory that Christensen has about disruptive innovation. The startup companies will aim at things that are up in this quadrant because if they pick something in one of these quadrants, the big companies run them out of business before they can develop. There is a zone of death around the big companies that the startup companies will not go into here. But as the startup company incubates its idea, the risk goes down and they either become a target for acquisition or for licensing. So the real challenge for the uh, big company is timing. If you move too early, there's still too much risk left and the enemies of the project inside your own company will kill it. Remember, this is a technology that might disrupt some of your existing business. It takes a real dictator like Steve Jobs to develop a disruptive innovation inside the company. Um, imagine what it was like when he says, by the way, we're going to start making a smartphone. We don't do that. We know the computer industry. We know the computer market. There is no value in smartphones. The phone companies are giving them away. So uh, it takes a dictator to do it. Otherwise, the big companies will watch on the outside. They'll be involved through their investing activities by doing POCs and so forth. And then at the right timing, they set up a relationship with the startup company. Yeah, this is, sorry, I'm, I guess I got off of that. That's, that's what I meant to show. Um, so this is hard. It means that for a company really to do well here in Silicon Valley, the uh, top level, the strategic level of the company has to have flexibility in their vision of the company. Uh, I have a lot of companies that are coming to me and supporting our work at Stanford who are trying to achieve these goals. So Bridgestone has been supporting my research for a couple of years. Are they a tire company or are they a mobility company like they claim to be? Right? How do you have that flexibility in your planning and yet continue to deliver really good benefit for, with what you have? But everybody in the company has to have the ability to learn from outside. This is a new term in, in business studies. 
It's especially popular in Europe, by the way. Uh, and you have to incentivize all of the people to work with outside partners. This is harder than it looks. And so that's the kind of areas that we're working on at Stanford. But if you're talking to your companies, your industry, about what they can get from Silicon Valley, if it's a startup company and you really want to aim for rapid growth, this is a great place. If you're a big company, this is a place to look for these startup companies that have potentially disruptive ideas that are uh, possibly going to help your company not be stuck in a backwater as industry continues to evolve. So I think that the culture side we haven't talked much about. And very frankly, I think this is where Stanford's played a bigger role than anything else. More than uh, any specific technologies that came from Stanford, I think it's this culture of redefining problems as opportunities. Um, if you don't like the situation, what are you going to do about it <laughs> is kind of a question that uh, we hear at Stanford a lot. Also, through rigorous standards for thinking at early stages of a process, defining a problem carefully is something that Stanford always puts uh, effort into. When we talk to our students, the nicest thing you can say about them in a uh, letter of recommendation is that they uh, think rigorously. So a lot of this is really understanding people's real needs their latent desires and defining the problems that you're aiming to uh, solve. And the very last thing is uh, the ability to gain benefits from diversity. So everybody talks about diversity. This is not just men, women, it's not just multi-ethnic. This is a group of people who may come from very different technical and business backgrounds. Uh, and uh, interdisciplinary teams are the norm here. A lot of places, uh, startup companies will be formed only around engineers. Multi-background teams, you know, it, it is true that more than 50% of the working population in Silicon Valley in most technical areas were born in a foreign country. So this is an incredibly diverse place. Uh, We've got our challenges. The men-women men, women balance is not as good as it should be, but this is very much um, part of Silicon Valley culture, how to make a team work. One of the first PhD groups that I worked with at uh, Stanford had somebody from Japan, somebody from Korea, somebody from Turkey, somebody from Greece, somebody from Saudi Arabia, and somebody from Israel. You're thinking they should hate each other, and, and, but the mission united them, and they were a, an incredibly productive group. So this is Silicon Valley. So here's the summary. We focus on growth, especially in the value of stock, not just in terms of revenue, not just in terms of profit. It's really the value of the company. People want to grow as much as possible, as fast as possible. Uh, and the big companies are doing open innovation here. That's really, I think, one of the biggest reasons that large firms uh, locate in this area. Happy to take a few questions. Thanks for your attention. Back in the back. Well, that was a really uh, fascinating presentation. Thank you so very much. I was just curious if you could comment, um, you know, how much is a, a large tech company hurting itself by moving out of Silicon Valley? We hear a lot in the Bay Area about you know, the cost of expense here and you know, companies are moving off to Austin, moving off to Salt Lake City. You know, based on your really interesting information about the value of being here with all the startups and the inno in, you know, big companies being able to take advantage and stay ahead of that in innovation curve, how much are they uh, shooting themselves in the foot by, by leaving here? Well, it's really hard to measure, right? Because you're looking at something where the real impact may show up several years later. But I think that even if the company is moving headquarters somewhere else, I would almost bet you a nickel that they're leaving some sort of a group here of watchers. Now, 
the Japanese are great examples of people who put watchers in Silicon Valley in the 1960s and they've kept them here all this time. One of the reasons that's very difficult is because for a company to innovate, more people than the R&D group has to be involved. The watchers report back to their bosses, but can their bosses really bring that ability to learn and ability to change to the business unit, to the finance people? So I think that, uh, I, I'm afraid I can't quantify it, but it's a very dangerous kind of pattern. And I am seeing companies that you wouldn't expect um, to have a whole lot to do with Silicon Valley coming in. So John Deere uh, makes farm equipment, has bought one of the Silicon Valley startup companies that was doing intelligent uh, application of fertilizer and intelligent application of, of water, an IoT system for farm equipment. And after that, they opened an innovation system, uh, an innovation center in Silicon Valley. So they're, they've got people who are really interested in the new ideas here. Thanks. Next question. Okay, well, I will be around at lunchtime. I'd be happy to talk to people informally, happy to share uh, information, and you'll get the slides. If, uh, if you have any questions later, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Dasher. And um, you'll be around for lunch, yes? Okay, excellent. Um, speaking of which, uh, we have lunch. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's in the back of the room, I believe. It's already been delivered. Um, and we have a, do we have a short presentation to run? Do the video really quick? Okay, so before we break for lunch, we have a little two to three minute um, short video um, of a company that um, uh, used the Select USA, participated in the Select USA Summit, uh, and they are from Turkey, and they uh, opened an office here in San Jose. It's a short little uh, testimonial that we filmed, that Chris filmed. Um, so we'll show that to you, and then we'll break for lunch. It'll be in the back of the room, and then uh, just, uh, you know, you're welcome to stay here in the room, or, or uh, you can go right outside there, and we'll start up again at 12.15. Thank you. My name is Erhan Ark. Welcome to Pick and Watch. I'm founder and CEO of Pick and Watch. Uh, we help brands to increase their in-store engagement and measure their marketing success in the offline world. So we are Google Analytics for physical stores. When the shoppers touch the product, uh, the video plays at the exact moment. Uh, the customers know more about the product and it increase engagement. It increases the sales up to 10%. Nowadays, brick mortar stores losing their business to online stores um, because 90% of them built for pre-internet world. And that's why we designed a solution for brick and mortar stores to save them, save them money, and, and then uh, engage more shoppers in their stores to, to give a fun, to, to train, train them, to give more information in the stores. Otherwise, they're going to, to check in the product information via their mobile phones and they lose sales, they miss sales while the shoppers in the stores. While we were in Turkey, uh, U.S. commercial service guys reached out to us. They wanted me to the Select USA event in Washington, D.C. So uh, we, uh, we've been there and I chose the Silicon Valley because the, the technology, the heart of the technology in the world is Silicon Valley. So I moved to California and I applied for the E2 visa and I started my business in Silicon Valley. Um, and then right now uh, we are selling to Canada, Uruguay, Netherlands, Hong Kong and Dubai and so many uh, countries from San Jose. When I launched my office in the, the Silicon Valley, I hired local American citizens and then I started working with them to understand more about the different verticals with the different experienced people uh, locally and we work, start working with them and then we expand our business uh, not only in the California, we also uh, going to hire some local uh, citizens in uh, Bensonville, Arkansas. I definitely recommend the Select USA Summit uh, to, to other companies in Turkey, in Argentina, in Europe 
to, to, to join to the Select USA event to understand more about the market and how to make a business in the United States. So that's, uh, we, we had um, uh, invited Erhan to, to join us today. Unfortunately, he's at a trade show in New York. Um, but uh, but he we uh, met him actually uh, through Sadar, um, where you visited yesterday at SV Ignite. So he was at an event there, and Shannon Frazier from our office was there as well. And so that's how we uh, we learned about his his company and his partic participation in Select USA. Um, with that, we will just uh, break for lunch, and we'll be back again at twelve fifteen. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Joe had also just reminded me um, to share with you all that we are recording uh, the sessions from today um, for most of our presenters um, have, uh, have, have kindly um, let us know that that's fine. And so we'll be sharing those um, videos. Uh, don't, don't expect them this week. And we'll, let, we'll send you an email when they're all ready to go. And we will be um, uh, sharing uh, the PowerPoints, um, as I mentioned, um, before the end of this week. So do look for those. Well, our next subject um, is, we've heard a lot about this morning, we certainly did um, yesterday as well, and that's venture capital. Uh, and um, we've, heard, we've heard a lot of different perspectives on that this morning as well as yesterday too, in terms of um, how that makes the, the engine of the valley, uh, what the different options are. We saw some of those yesterday in terms of you know, the incubator and how they um, relate to their companies who are coming into the incubator. Uh, we have had a little bit of um, uh, coverage of that this morning in terms of our IP discussion, as well as kind of a little bit in a certain sense on the uh, on the real estate side too. Um, and we have a real treat. Uh, we have a real treat this afternoon. Um, we have an expert speaker from 500 Startups. Um, if you are familiar um, with 500 Startups, they are renowned um, here in the Valley and worldwide for the support and services that they um, provide to accelerate their portfolio companies. Uh, joining us today is Vijay Rajendran. Vijay is the Director of Innovation and Partnerships at 500 Startups. He has been supporting founders, startup founders, since he was a 19-year-old student interning at a VC at a venture leasing firm in Boston in the late 90s. Previously, he developed partnerships with startups and worked directly with entrepreneurs and residents at, global, at the Global Bank BBVA in San Francisco. He was also a management consultant and founded a gourmet e-commerce company Hungry Globetrotter. He grew up in five different countries. I guess maybe that's where the Hungry Globetrotter comes from, possibly. Um, VJ was a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon, where he worked in microfinance. He received a BS in Business Administration from Boston University, as well as an MS in Foreign Service and an MBA from Georgetown. VJ, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Joanne, and, and thank you to the U.S. Commercial Service, our, our friends here in, in San Jose, and uh, to Global SF for this very kind invitation to uh, be with you all today. Uh, I understand you've gotten to learn a lot about uh, venture capital incubators uh, and accelerators, uh, so uh, I, I don't want any of this to be repetitive. I'm kind of curious, what do you really want to know about venture today? Yes, in the back. Mm -hmm. Who are we interested to meet? Okay, yeah. Very important. Other things. What have you wanted to ask, but haven't asked yet? Thoughts in the back of your mind? Yes, sir. What about the due diligence? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so share a little bit about how we look at startups. Okay, important. You want to ask something for a friend? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
How do we manage the investor pipeline? Yes. That, that trend is happening. It isn't affecting our thesis, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, though. But thank you for, for raising that topic. Um, yes? Yeah, yeah, corporate partnership. There are some venture firms, and, and ours is one, uh, that, that run corporate partnerships. Absolutely. Cool. These are all great questions. So I think I'm in the right room. So. Uh, first, a legal notice. Uh, first, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to give you legal advice. This is also not a solicitation for investment. So, uh, About me. So uh, Joanna was very kind in her, um, uh, in her introduction. And so I am like a lot of people. I don't have like one certain profile in venture. And it turns out I've done a whole bunch of things that together are, are sort of useful. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about 500 startups. So we are one of the most global uh, venture capital firms, perhaps the most global venture capital firm in the world. Uh, and so we have uh, over you know, half a billion dollars of committed capital. Uh, that is actually a lot for a seed st stage firm, because as I'll describe, we write very small checks and try and be some of the earliest backers of companies. Uh, we have more than 500 startups. We have more than 2,300 portfolio companies now uh, that we've invested in. Uh, more than 75 com countries uh, around the world. And uh, that's all in just like the last decade. So uh, we do that through our network of colleagues who are in 20 cities worldwide and growing, as well as in a number of different funds. Uh, as a result, uh, we've now got a, a portfolio that includes 15 unicorns. So uh, hands up, anyone who doesn't know what a unicorn is? Okay, yeah, so unicorns, companies valued at more than a billion dollars, and uh, actually that, th I, I need to update this slide because Carousel, which is what we call a, used to, or, well, Carousel used to be a centaur that is worth between 100 million and a billion dollars, is, uh, was now recently valued at um, over a billion in its most recent financing. Uh, so interesting thing about this portfolio is it is increasingly international. So we were one of the first firms to go international. And uh, to you know the point of the question, like, do we see the valley overheating? And are we looking at deals that are outside the rest of the world? Yes, always, and have been. Hence, uh, you know, 40% of our unicorns are outside the United States, uh, particularly in uh, places like Southeast Asia or um, in uh, uh, I guess in, in Europe as well, uh, but you know we we see like growth in particular uh, you know geographies, uh, and you know we're 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 trying to be some of the first uh, investors there. Uh, as I said, we're uh, very active. Uh, so you know in the last uh, I guess last year uh, we got ranked number one by P Pitchfork in terms of uh, total number of investments that we were making, uh, and we take it beyond just like capital to uh, make sure we're also uh, able to share what it means to, um, to be an investor. So yes, we accelerate startups, and you, you've heard a little bit uh, already, I understand, about startup acceleration. But we also work with investor groups. And this is really important, because if you want to create upstream capital, if you want people to back more startups back home, or even here in the United States, you need to have people who will write uh, uh, um, angel investment checks, uh, who, um, who will be uh, limited partners or investors in funds. And that's all really beneficial because it creates an ecosystem, of course, of providers of, of capital for the most like fragile of early ideas and uh, the most uh, uh, risky, of course, of, of new ventures. And so through programs that we have uh, here in the Bay Area, uh, at Stanford and Berkeley, uh, in uh, Europe and Asia with uh, INSEAD at their campuses, uh, in Miami and uh, in, in the Middle East and, and soon uh, elsewhere in Asia as well, uh, we have uh, taken the knowledge that we have and our experience in, in starting 
more than 22 funds and investing in different countries and so forth, and um, documents that are open source. Anyone in this room can, can get what we call a, a, a KISS uh, doc, which is our, our term sheet for uh, investing in, uh, in startups. And, and we want to be open source. So uh, whether it's uh, how to like help the, uh, the company we're accelerating get more, um, more progress faster, uh, or whether it's like the, in the, the situation where we want to like provide more information to uh, the, the future investors, uh, we make sure that we create uh, opportunities for that to happen. Uh, so there was a question about like, do we work with corporates and stuff we do? Uh, the answer is, uh, is yes. So the, we see ourselves as open source venture, like really an open innovation platform. And so as, as I mentioned, we have this like investment pillar, which is really important to what we do. We accelerate companies, and now that through, we've done that in more than 50 programs in over 15 countries, uh, and we do that with a global network of over 250 mentors, and also we can tie in uh, our, our family, our community of over 3,000 entrepreneurs that we know. There's the education part that I mentioned. Uh, so we've trained uh, you know, hundreds of investors uh, from around the world, which is like really exciting because then we see this innovation platform getting um, more uh, active and, and busier. Uh, and then on top of that, there's work we do with, uh, with corporate partners from around the world. And uh, that cuts across all kinds of different industries from uh, e-commerce to, uh, to automotive, uh, oil and gas, uh, and, uh, and many others, transportation is there as well. Uh, and that has everything uh, to do with how do big companies see, find, and invest in the innovation ecosystem, uh, which is really important if you're just trying to get insights about what's happening in, in an ecosystem like the Valley, like all of you are doing today, or if perhaps uh, you want to like find companies and partner with them or separately maybe invest either setting up your own corporate venture capital uh, unit or perhaps being an investor in, in third party uh, funds that, that fit your uh, interest in, uh, in deal flow and, and a pipeline of startups that you can work with. So we have this, this success we've achieved so far because we have great partners that we work with. Uh, and that could be uh, you know, some of the corporates that I mentioned or, or academic institutions, uh, but also uh, a lot of um, you know, public sector entities. So for example, we have a program with Enterprise Singapore where they ha want to bring the best uh, startups from the world to Singapore and the best Singaporean startups to the Valley and other places. And so through that program that we call Global Launch, uh, we've been able to, to host the first batch uh, of companies uh, from Singapore in the Valley and, and then like bring a number uh, to, to Singapore as well. So what are we looking for? Uh, well, you know, you've, you've met some folks in accelerators. You, you understand, of course, that VCs invest in startups. Uh, but, you know, how to know when to make an introduction requires understanding the sort of special weird way and place in which like VCs invest. So if we, we think about what a VC wants to do, a VC basically wants to find a $20 bill lying on the sidewalk or you know, to pick up. In other words, they want to like find people who have traction, who have already built their product, it's got some market fit already, and the team is amazing, and like you know, everything just like checks all the boxes, right? And so th they want risk to be there, and then they want to bring capital in anticipation of scale, in anticipation of exponential growth, of course, in in sales. And so what that means is there's there's a VC, but fortunately there's lots of other people who participate in this system, and that um, is of course the you know, the, the angels we talked about, where there is actually a lot of risk. Like when you're a, an angel investor, you're it, it's almost unfair. You're taking so much more risk than uh, a, a venture capitalist. And, uh, you know, you're, you're writing a lot of small checks and you've got to wait way longer before sales start materializing and before this company starts to become valuable. And so when we think about that, uh, the the place where uh, 500 plays, where we try to be the first institutional check into uh, a startup, which is seed, 
is ki kind of, uh, it used to be you know, uh, something that was part of VC, but has now merged as its own uh, unique asset class. And so knowing what kind of VC you're introducing people to matters a lot in terms of the stage of the company, how far they are for, uh, in terms of their, their progress, and whether or not uh, it's, of course, a fit with their, their thesis and things that they're, they're looking for. Um, but you know, understanding the, the first that the venture has broken into many different parts, and even within VC, there's early stage, there's late stage, there's uh, there's probably a bunch of different like uh, flavors in between. Um, it's it's really uh, complex, but here I've kind of aggregated it. And so I mentioned the thesis. What is that? Well, VCs never invest in just anything. So you're gonna hear people like say things and you sometimes they're stated and then what there's what they're really looking for. Uh, but they're going to like make pronouncements like, you know, we we are investing in connected hardware that makes homes smarter and, en and more energy efficient. So that might be, let's say a, a corporate venture investor who's looking for things that are a fit with their ecosystem of, of, of products and things like that. Alternatively, you have folks that are investing uh, with, with an impact focus. So at the bottom here, you know, they may say, we're investing in black and Latino, Latina founders who make up more than 30% of US consumers, which is a totally underserved market, and I'm going to like, in, invest in that. So thinking about the, the VC's thesis and understanding them and understanding the potential fit with the pipeline of startups that you work with makes a lot of sense. If someone says, oh, I'm a hardware VC, and it's like, oh, that's great. I have a battery tech um, company that came my way. I'd love to introduce you, is, is, is not enough. Like, certainly within hardware, as we can all imagine, there's a, a range of, of, of different uh, verticals of, uh, of applications, like maybe it's just IIoT, uh, who knows like how granular that can get. So uh, it almost requires some sort of CRM, you know, some sort of uh, um, management system in which you're going to tag and, and, and keep track of like, yes, I met this person, they're really interesting, their, their firm invests in this, but they in particular are like excited about like some uh, element you know, beneath the surface. And so that, that is uh, really worth uh, highlighting. So what is our investment thesis? So what, what is it that we're looking for? So as I mentioned, we, we hover around seed, right? So um, there's, remember I said that this thing gets like sliced and diced into many pieces. So even within seed, there's like pre-seed, there's seed, there's post-seed. So post-seed company is someone who uh, hasn't quite uh, got product market fit and they're not ready for a series A, but uh, they do have something in the market and they're, they're, they're probably still pivoting. Uh, a seed stage company might be a company that's just on the cusp of product market fit. Pre-seed, they haven't quite got revenue, but maybe they ha they're halfway to a product. Um, and, and then, you know, Angel, it might be something that's, um, you know, e even before that. So there's no hard and fast on that, like, product market fit spectrum. Uh, but what we try and do is use a lot of analytics to uh, try and create as much of a data-driven process as possible. Because at 500 startups, we look at about 10,000 companies a year. Uh, for our flagship accelerator in San Francisco, for example, we look at about 3,000. And we accept about three dozen, at, at the moment less. And the reason it's, uh, it's so hard is that we're just trying to capture the top 1% of seed stage startups in the world. Uh, in, in order to generate the returns. Because this is a business we're in where we're only going to really make money on the, the companies that are transformational, that change their whole industries, that, 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 or that invent new segments. Everything else um, is, is great. And, and there, there should be like companies that are, um, that are not unicorns. But for someone who has a, a classic venture capital structure and is a financial investor, you know, we're, we're trying to like, capture that very uh, top spectrum of, of companies. Uh, in the case of, of corporate investment, in the case of uh, mezzanine finance, and in, in a whole number of other uh, categories, it makes sense to invest in something that 
might be profitable right, right now, could eventually be a, uh, a nice $50 million like uh, valuation business uh, and, and, and exit, and, and, and the, but that's a, a different asset class that, uh, that operates with a different set of, uh, of, of levers. But we're looking at um, companies that will be able to get to scale with uh, ideally no more than a million dollars of, of, of capital that they need to raise next. We're, so we're not going to invest in a solar farm because that would maybe be a great investment, but it would cost millions of dollars to build out that infrastructure. So we uh, alternatively, we may invest in uh, companies that are uh, like really tech enabled. So it doesn't have to be hard tech every time. Uh, but it, there has to be uh, technology behind the business. So you might have an idea for an awesome uh, restaurant chain, but we're never going to invest in that, uh, and, and things of, of, of that nature. So we have a, n a number of criteria. I won't give you all of ours because it's going to be different from someone else's, but that's like uh, important in the conversations you have and the VCs you get to know uh, how they look at the world and uh, how they're going to like kick something back to you. They may say, you know, this isn't good, that isn't good, uh, but um, for, for us, we, we have like specific metrics we're looking at. Beyond the metrics though, uh, I will get into um, what are the big categories uh, that, that you, we pay attention to and, and probably you should too. So I mentioned only a few companies make money for us. Like the reason that's true is because this is like the Hunger Games of Silicon Valley. Uh, has, has everyone seen the movie Hunger Games or read the books? Okay, so this is like absolutely gruesome. I've been a founder of two companies and this is like hell on earth. What happens is you might start with 577 companies uh, that we invested in in one uh, cohort or one uh, that we looked at. How many got from that seed stage to series A? About a quarter. Um, and then or, or actually, I should say this, this is uh, th this isn't indicative of, uh, of our uh, performance, but, but, but rather like one sample we looked at. And then from that point, how many get from like series A to series B? Only 64. But you're not done yet. You're, you're now you just have built a business that might survive, but you're still dependent on a lot of capital in order to grow. So then you get to series C and it's only like 5%. Like the, and at that point, you know, you could ra you could be worth a hundred million dollars, but that's considered, you know, a pretty mediocre. Uh, to get, you know, to Series D or later, like that's just two point five percent of all companies. So that is really daunting. It's really hard, and that's why we're going to be really picky. And you're going to send a lot of leads to investors, and they're going to say no a lot. But much like the founders who are like pitching all the time, you've got to learn from that and like go and, and, and look in a smart way from other companies you might consider. So here's our 5T framework. So this is how we think uh, and how many VCs, at least at the early stage, are, are going to think. So what do we care about? Team, transaction, the technology, at least that it's tech enabled, some of the trends, and then the terms of, of the deal. So can go into a lot of detail behind all of these. Uh, we, we, can, we can be here all day, but I'll, I'll try and highlight a few key bullets in the uh, time we have left. So execution capacity on the, the team side. Can they do this job? Like, is this team going to pull it off? Like, if, if, it's, if your answer isn't like definitively yes, you, 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 you need to walk. Uh, the skills, like, is the, uh, are they actually like um, going to, be the, the right team. Because uh, sometimes there is like the, the temperament and then there's also like the, the credentials and the ability and aptitude of the, the team. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other things, unit economics. These aren't things that you'll necessarily be able to like answer and validate and can't be like responsible for due diligence, but you'll know if people haven't thought about this or I'm bringing it to you. Uh, that, that should be a definitive red flag. Uh, and the same applies to customers and users. So we, we can get a lot of data and we can like actually tell if, if people are, um, are on the right track based on like do they have a clue? Are they already doing some of this very early on uh, when they apply to 500 startups? Um, 
again, the project has to be compelling. Someone must n want this and be fanatical about it. Uh, it, it. Or alternatively, is there a compelling new business model? Like, does it do old things in new ways? Uh, and then we care about the total addressable market. I was seeing a pitch from a healthcare company last week, really smart people, like literally the entire like team came out of uh, Harvard Innovation Center. They had built this wonderful piece of hardware. And then I asked like how many users are it? And there was like, oh, like they're, they're like, it, it was for the healthcare market, there are three million patients in the United States. And that sounds like a big number, three million patients, but actually it's not. If you think about how many people would have to rip and replace this like piece of hardware on their wheelchair and like have insurance pay for it and so forth. So really maybe there are only 30,000 customers, 300,000 customers, or uh, yeah, and, and, and a actually much smaller number than we really think. And so we, we do our own back of the envelope math and we'll expect and you should expect founders to do the same. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff around terms and ownership, like the valuation, the cap. Sometimes we want to invest in a company, but it turns out there's a lot of like funny ownership and things that don't make sense. Maybe people like have an, uh, an, an LLC in Florida. Do you know who did that? Mark Zuckerberg. When he tried to raise money, he had an LLC in Florida and uh, someone convinced him like, actually you should have a C Corp in Delaware because that's what people will invest money into. So like, that, that's, a, that's a silly example, but uh, from, from the, from the uh, owner, the uh, incorporation, all the way to like how you have uh, a set of owners or um, on, the, on the cap table that may or may not be um, problematic are things that we will uh, eventually care about. So I'm gonna stop right there, I feel I'll go back a slide, and uh, pause for a couple minutes for more questions. <laughs>